something we haven't talked about in years. Um, actually, almost exactly four years ago, I talked about RODI systems on this channel in a live stream. I cannot believe that, considering I sell these for a living. So before you're even worried, oh, this is a sales pitch, no, we're gonna talk about how they operate, we're gonna talk about how to work on them, we're gonna talk about uh, upgrades, you know, all the fun stuff. But it's not a sales pitch, I swear. Now, if you wanna buy anything, yes, thank you very much, I appreciate that, you can go to my website, and you can buy yourself all the stuff you want. <laughs> if it's RODI related and I have it in stock, I mean, I mean, if I um, stock it, you should grab it. But uh, that is not the point of this stream today. As always, all these streams are always about education and understanding what's going on and learning how to work with the gear that you have or the gear you're about to buy. So I hope that you find this interesting. I put one example of a uh, RO here on, this, on the counter. This is the 100 gallon a day system I sell, which means it can make 100 gallons in one 24 hour period. But before we do that, I had a couple of things I wanted to talk about. So I'm wearing a really cool shirt um, <clears throat> and I wanted, uh, uh, see, I forgot something. I spent the last hour and a half setting up. Still forgot one thing. I need to read an email to you guys, so let me find it. <laughs> I asked permission from the customer if it would be okay, and he said yes. So, let's see, where is he? That's not what I want. Hang on, it's gonna take me one second here. Actually, I can do an email search. Copy. and I'll explain why I want to do this. Okay, so I got that on my screen. I'm ready for that. <laughs> uh, but before we get started, I want to explain why I'm going to read this to you because um, uh, this arrived two days ago and I spoke with the person immediately and they got one of these shirts. And it was their email that inspired me of what to do with the rest of these shirts that I am giving away for free to people that have been banned, you can't just say I want it even though you've never even been to Reef Central, okay? Uh, I got banned in 2010, everyone was shell-shocked last time I revealed that and it's no secret, it's been a decade. But um, the thing is they're sitting in the closet <laughs> and I want them gone and I don't really wanna throw them away because they're perfectly fine. So these shirts right here are, um, I have two sizes. So that's the first thing you need to know. Um, I have mediums and I have larges. Anything other than that disqualifies you because it won't fit you, so there's no point asking. Uh, so you have to be banned and you gotta fit the shirt. And ideally, I'd love it if you were in the US just for shipping purposes specifically. Now, um, the shirt, I'm holding, I'm wearing one, but I mean, this is the front of it. And on the back, it says, Milev made me do it, and it's got the Milev's Reef logo. And it was a joke. And uh, I thought it'd be funny, and a lot of people bought them in California. <laughs> at one show, but I got in trouble for it. And like, you can't do that. And I thought, I think it's brilliant. But anyway, I'm giving them away. So here's the email. And then I will explain my inspiration. I saw you on YouTube that you sell t-shirts and I saw the one I'd like to get the sexy shrimp shirt and extra large. However, the shipping method show pick up in person. What do I do? Uh, that is something my website does. It offers the opportunity to pick up an order in person and not pay shipping. But 99% of people have me ship their orders to them. So if you live near Fort Worth, Texas and you wanna pick up an order, yes, you're welcome to do so and save a little bit of money. I also heard you have the band from Reef Central t-shirts and I'd love to know how I can get a hold of a t-shirt like that. Preferably in my size, but if not, I would frame it <laughs> and put it in my home office. Even better if it was signed, so I could put it next to my signed baseball Tom uh, Linsom, I hope I said that right, I don't know the baseball players, uh, jersey. So he wanted an autographed shirt. And I'm like, are you sure? And he's like, yes, absolutely. And I was like, okay. So I autographed it and, and shipped it to him. I was banned for early around 2004, 2006 and later reinstated. However, the experience soured my taste to the point where I didn't use the internet for reefing until about two years ago. It left me in the dark as to how much information exists on YouTube and other channels. Books are still awesome. Yes, I agree, that's true. The Reef Central ban was over posting pictures of an 85 gallon SPS dominated tank with T12 XHOs and VHO bulbs visible in the photo. So uh, a moderator told me that I was posting pictures of falsified situation. It was impossible to grow corals like that under anything other than metal halides when I responded, likely snidely in the email, and with a response to the comments on the post, I was banned. So. He posted a picture of his tank with his lighting, was accused of lying, and got banned when he 
defended himself, even though he probably was a smart aleck. Um, I stated in the comments above that, are, that it's ridiculous. At the time, I was an engineering student using PhD physicists to evaluate lighting options for a reef tank, which was free access at the time. And I wrote a response that said, a watt is a watt and a lumen is a lumen, and they aren't the same, but related. The biggest thing I wrote was that I had an issue with the intensity measured in lumens and spectrum and colors and all the corals care about. It doesn't matter where it comes from or if you match it or even if it were from an LED light that would be coming soon. The corals won't care. There was some uh, mathy conversation stated and statements about how I hate uh, Millie Candela and Steradians. Wow, this guy's way over my head. <laughs> I didn't even notice that the first time I read this. How did I skip past it when it's a word I don't know? I usually stop. <clears throat> After I was banned, sometime later, I saw some of my posts reposted in other threads, responded to the moderator that was emailing me very kindly, but, you know, what the hell. And a few weeks later, I got an automated reinstated email with no comment or reasoning. I don't think I even logged into Reef Central for at least 12 years after that. And when I did, it was only to see if any of my pictures from my older tanks may still be there, but didn't even make it that far into searching. I was at the time designing an LED light, thinking I could test it and sell it. Stupid to quit now. <laughs> and couldn't come up with about $500 in materials, so I labeled it, so yeah, I, no, so I tabled it until I graduated. About a year after graduation, Dr. Foster's and Smith had an LED light. So that was Taylor's email. So he told me a story of how he got banned, and I mean, it was a ridiculous reason. He uh, was accused of, you're using LEDs, heresy, that's not possible, it has to be metal halide, and got a, banned, and was so turned off, he never even looked back. He never even went back for years, you know, for over a decade. So if you are wanting one of these shirts, all you have to do is tell me your story of how you got banned. That's not even a contest, that's just history. That's like me doing my diaries, Tell me your diary. Tell me what happened that got you in trouble. And uh, if I like it, you're going to get a t-shirt for free. Um, and uh, that's, that's it. So that's it. It's Like I said, it's not even a contest. Um, and then I had one more thing I want to talk about briefly because, you know, people sometimes ask me, what do you read? <laughs> they like to know what's going on. And they ask me, uh, you know, so, you know, do you have other hobbies or, or you know, what do you focusing on or where do you get your education from and I just want to show you this magazine so this is Diver Alert um, I believe it's published or offered by Dan which is the divers uh, I should know this by heart right whatever Dan said oh my god how do I not know this let's call it Divers Alert Network I don't know if that's correct or not but um they're, they're all about dive safety and getting yourself uh, protected, being part of their collective group. You actually pay a membership once a year. And with that membership, you get this magazine, and you also are protected during a trip. If something bad happens, they will help you with medical needs. And there's a form of insurance involved. So, I mean, that's why I always renew it every single year, even though I haven't been able to dive in two years due to COVID. But I'm reading this, and I'm just like, oh, my God, this is so interesting. I want to dive here. 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 <laughs> I'm just, like, adding up my head. 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 dollars in trips, you know, but the locations that were shown here, Roatan, you know, Cozumel, um, uh, Rajampat, which I'm going to next April, in Indonesia, these are all exciting things to do, and then there was even, which I can't believe I cared, <laughs> there was an opportunity to go diving in the freshwater lakes of Michigan to look at these wrecks that have been there since like 1850 that have completely uh, held up and look you know, I mean, they're, they're encrusted with stuff, but they are not damaged or deteriorated because it's fresh water, not salt water. And I'm just like, you know, I might actually want to jump into a lake for once in my life. So I wanted to tell you that um, this is kind of the stuff I like to read. <laughs> I really do enjoy uh, this. There's some fantastic pictures. If you are a diver, you should be a member of Dan. If you're not a diver, you should subscribe. You should get it anyway, because not only did they have in here um, some really good stories and some fantastic pictures of some really cool creatures, I almost wanted to just show you on camera what's in here, but then I thought maybe I'll get in trouble for sharing copyrighted material. Uh, so anyway, I'm not going to do that. But um, it also has in here a lot of stories of people that had an incident underwater and had to be treated medically or had to handle it with the doctor thereafter. And those stories are some of the stories that motivated me to become a diver. The more horror stories I read, the more I wanted to dive because I was like, wow, this is really fascinating. 
and you have to be really cautious and you are in control of every breath you take and you are in charge of all the gear you're wearing. No one else can help you with that situation. I mean, they can a little bit, but really you're on your own. <laughs> you have a dive buddy. They have more air in case there's lack of air, but if something else goes wrong with your gear, if you suddenly have a, the, the vest you wear inflates uh, like a balloon and you can't stop it, you have to be able to deflate it immediately during a panic crisis while your brain's freaking out. Um, there's a lot of things going around. You lose your weights, uh, and there's so many things that can happen. And so it tells stories like that in here. And I, I actually read those more than I read the stories about, oh, I went on this fantastic trip to this beautiful place. So those are a couple things that I wanted to share with you today. We still have sound. No one's screaming at me that, um, <laughs> that I have no audio. I think we're good for today. I hope so. I've, I've been watching a lot of uh, streaming uh, tutorial videos. I know some guys wear monitors in their ear, and I'm not sure what exactly they're hearing. I'm halfway tempted to buy one for 50 bucks and plug it in and plug it into the computer, and maybe I'll just hear, maybe I'll just hear when the audio goes out. Maybe that's what it is. It's just, you don't hear yourself. I don't know, I guess you hear yourself. I, I don't know how that works, and no one really tells you <laughs> in these videos. I'm like, ugh, so. But it is kind of embarrassing when you're doing a stream and people are like, can't hear you. You've been gone for eight minutes. I'm always embarrassed by that. Okay, so let's talk about the RODI system and how it works because uh, that is the first primary function. And why you even need one? Why do I even care? Why? I can just buy my water at the fish store and bring it home in jugs. Yes, you absolutely can. Other people don't even do that. They go to Walmart or CVS or someplace that has a water machine in front of the building and fill up their jugs there. Or they have water delivered to their door like um, uh, Ozarka or Sparklets or one of those type of brands that are out there on the market. And you are getting some water, but you don't know the quality of that water. You assume that water is good. You're not verifying that the water is good. So they make the water, they put it in your jug, you haul it home. That already is more work than I want to do, believe it or not. I don't like the idea of hauling a jug of water. Each jug holds five gallons of water, five times, let's just round it up to 10. That's a 50 pound jug, and it's really eight pounds per gallon, but whatever. So you're, look, you're lifting 40 to 50 pounds per jug into your car while you're driving. If you don't have it sealed tightly, which some people don't, they have the vent hole on there and they lost the cap that goes on the vent. It's sloshing and spilling over into the trunk or the back seat or the floorboard. Uh, none of that sounds pleasant. Plus, you are bending over in a very unnatural way with a 50-pound jug repeatedly to put in several, and then you're bending over to lift it out. You can actually hurt your lower back. So I'm not telling you you're wrong. I'm just saying there's things to keep in mind. And some people can't even lift this kind of weight for medical reasons, okay? Uh, they might have just recently had surgery, and the doctor says don't lift anything over a gallon of milk. And when you're in that situation, you're like, well, what about my aquarium? I need top off. I need water changes. Yes, you can get people to help, but are they going to actually go to the store and buy your water? Can you buy enough water and have it on hand before your surgery to last six weeks? And there's a lot of things to keep in mind. Now, there are always solutions to questions, and you just have to plan it out. And with enough preparation, you can overcome anything. But having a system in your home that can make the water for you on demand, day or night, holiday or not, is really convenient. And it's the thing I did forever ago. I went from using tap water out of the sink with water conditioner to this. And when I say this, I literally mean this one. This is not like the original one that was made you know, back in 2002 or whenever I bought it. But I have been selling this ever since I got my first one from eBay. And uh, to just kind of shorten the story incredibly briefly, the company that sold it on eBay ended up choosing to go a different route, wanted to do a different business. And when I reached out to them and said, hey, I want to sell them, they gave me the information and I've been selling them ever since. So I actually am very intimately familiar with how these operate. I have a lot of videos on this channel explaining every single thing that you can do with your system. And I also have a huge FAQ section on my website just dedicated to RODI that covers every single thing, including what is that hissing sound when it's on, okay? So I mean, it's all there and I'm there, it's there to help you make your life as easy as possible. But today we're gonna kind of cover some of these things. Now let's say you are fine with making water at home and you don't want to haul it home you don't want to bring it from somewhere else but okay wait i'm jumping ahead the jugs of water you're carrying the water home in you may have some salt water jugs and you probably have some rodi water jugs for the top off right sometimes we mix those up even if you write salt and ro someone makes a mistake and the salt water goes in your pure container now your pure container each time it gets used and new water goes in can become slightly polluted so what you could do 
you need to buy one. It's called a TDS meter. And this is a handheld one that I offer for my shop. They're $25. And there's a cap on the bottom. And there is a button on the front to turn it on. So, as a matter of fact, I've got a couple of extra cameras today to make things better. Let's see if I can do this. So, here's the TDS meter. No, nope. trying to figure out which camera I'm looking at. <laughs> um, and on the display, it shows a number. And then you would put it in your sample of water. So, there is this is our way of measuring, and you wait about 20 seconds or 10 seconds, and you'll see the number on the display. Now, you want to use a very clean cup. I'm just using this as an example. I really like a styrofoam cup that's disposable, a one-time use, because nothing's been in it. It's pure. It's clean. You put your RODI water, you put this in there, it should measure zero. As you pour water out of your jug into the meter, you may discover that uh, your water is not nearly as clean as you thought it was. The, the problem is, with use, these jugs that get get dirty inside, and they're very hard to clean out because you can't reach your arm in there and wipe it down. So if you do need to clean out jugs that are measuring higher in TDS, you would want to take a, a 10 parts water, one part bleach, pour it in there, put the lid on, shake it really, really good, just get it all over the inside, then rinse it super well, and let it air dry for 24 hours. And then the next time you fill it up with RODI water, it should be measuring zero. Maybe it'll measure one, but I mean, it should be almost nothing. But if you check your RODI water and it's 13, 40, 80, uh, your jug could be polluting perfectly good water. Or, this is the, the dark side of the hobby sometimes, the water you're getting from the store may not be pure anymore either, even though you thought it is and you're paying a lot of money for it. So you do want to measure the water that they're selling you on the spot. Now what you can do is you can say, hey, can you give me some of that RO water in one of your fish bags? You know, the brand new bags they haven't used yet, and they collect, you know, an amount and then you put your TDS meter in that bag and see what you're measuring and if it looks good tell them fill up your jugs and if it looks bad then you can decide what you want to do next you cannot measure the TDS of salt water it's that meter is designed for fresh water only the salt the calcium the alkalinity the magnesium the iodine all that stuff would not work and it'll actually erode the the contacts of the TDS meter. So do not do that. Don't ever stick it in your tank. Don't stick it in your saltwater jugs. It is only to measure fresh water. Now you can use the TDS meter to measure fresh water everywhere. You can measure in the jugs you talk, I talked about. You can measure in your top off reservoir. You can measure the tap water coming out of the sink. Now, these are all places where we have fresh water. And I would just recommend you own a TDS meter. And if you don't, it's time to buy one. This is a nicer TDS meter that I offer for my 150 gallon a day RODI system. And this one has an, an easy to find on off button on the front. And then it shows the number on the front. And this is showing zero. And there's actually two buttons on here for in and out because there's two probes. And the way these would work is you would install this somewhere in your system. Preferably, I would recommend, here's your RO system, here's your DI, and I would install the meter to where it measures between here and here and what measures coming out of the DI. So you measure before the DI and after the DI. And because you want to know if the membrane is doing its job. And the only way to know that is to read the meter. So having a meter to do that is possible. Now, if you cannot do that or you don't want to buy the expensive meter, that one right there I showed you is $50. If you wanted to uh, measure it manually, you can have your tubing coming out of the RO, go into your clean styrofoam cup, take a sample, measure it. My number is four, okay. Then you have your tubing come out, you, you dump out your cup and you put in another sample, measure zero, everything's working well. That is the way you measure TDS on the RO side as well as the DI side. And anytime you have an RO problem, people say, what is your TDS coming out of the pipes? What is your TDS coming out of the membrane? And what is your TDS coming out of the DI? And that, I mean, you have to answer these questions. And if you don't know the answers, stop asking for help until you know the <laughs> answers. Because that's what happens. They're like, oh, I don't think it's working right. And you have and super vague, no uh, spe specifics to where anyone can help you. And so they're gonna ask you those questions. They're also gonna ask you what's the temperature of your water. They're gonna ask you what's your PSI, which would require having a pressure gauge on your RO system, or at least having a handheld pressure gauge that you can screw on to a hose bib outside to check the pressure of the house. And you could say, hey, my water pressure in my home measures 60 PSI. Everyone's gonna say, okay, good, you're good to go. If your house is measuring 25, 30 PSI, this is not gonna work as well as you'd like. Okay, so we have uh, discussed what happens in a fish store, what happens with the jugs that you're using constantly and how you have to purify them from time to time so that things are nice and clean. 
And now we are going to talk about the RO system itself. It has to be installed in your home somewhere, and I really recommend it's bolted to the wall. It's got screw holes in the mount for a reason. It's not good to just stand it up on a shelf because if something's happening and you're like pulling on the tubing and that thing comes crashing down, it could hit you, your children, your pet, or just the floor itself and break stuff. So we want to make sure this is secure. Matter of fact, I put it on the table and I was like, oh, I hope this doesn't move. But really, these are made of acrylic. They can crack. These fittings, they break. <laughs> so we want to take really good care of our equipment and we want to install it properly. I really recommend that this is not just screwed to the sheetrock, but that you actually put a board on the wall, even a small board that's just, you know, this tall, that's from stud to stud, and then you put the RO system on there with the DI and bolt it to the wood, and that way you know nothing's gonna move. Because empty, this is 18 pounds. Once you add water to it, it's more like 35 pounds probably. So we wanna make sure that we have enough strength, not only to keep it on the wall, but also when it's time to change these filters and you have to use the filter wrench, to remove each housing and you're wrenching on it, you don't want this thing to come loose. You don't want it to come crashing down. And trust me, I get emails from people saying, hey, so um, I need to get this fitting and that fitting because I dropped the entire system, it hit my washing machine, and yeah, now my washing machine's got a dent and all this stuff. So please secure it, even if you're in a rental. You know what? I know people don't want to get in trouble with the landlord. It's okay to put something solid on the wall, just like you put it pictures and paintings on the wall and you put things that a TV you mount it to the wall right TVs are not light and you don't get in trouble for that so put things on the wall the way you can if you can't do that perhaps you can put an eyelet which is a, a, a metal circle with a threaded screw and you can screw that into the stud on each side of this where it's sitting on a shelf and put a big bungee cord across the front to act like a seat belt to keep it from falling okay some people like to put these under the sink uh, there's not a lot of space down there, and it's very hard to work on these when they're in there, but it can be done. And because the tubing is long enough, you have six feet of tubing on these systems normally out of the box, you should be able to pull it out of the cabinet to work on it, and then carefully tuck it back in. If um, you have it up on the wall, you don't have to worry about any of this stuff. But I would not say, oh, I'll get in trouble, because you know when you move out, whenever you finally move out, you're always gonna go through the house and you're gonna look at all the little marks you left on the wall and you're gonna put some putty. You can do the exact same thing where that board was. Or you can just leave the board, paint the board the same color as the wall and just say, that's how the house came. <laughs> yes, I recommended you say something that's not quite true. Um, but I think that would be a, a good solution to making sure your stuff is safe. Now, um, I said it had to be mounted somewhere securely. It also needs to be mounted somewhere near cold water and a drain. So typically I love to have it near a washer dryer. That is like the most ideal spot because there's a cold water line coming out of the wall and there's a drain pipe right there. And when you get this, let me grab some cutters because I've got this all bundled together cleanly for the video. When you get this, you're gonna have that six foot of tubing I mentioned and you are going to put the black line in your drain. So here's your drain in the wall and you just push the tubing down in there. You do not need to go down nine feet. <laughs> that does not need to happen, okay? Just put it in the proper length. Um, if you feel like this isn't gonna be a factor for you, you could actually trim the length of this to be shorter to fit in that pipe, but it needs to be in enough that it can't pop out accidentally. Uh, a nice little uh, trick you could do when you put it in the drain with the, the drain that comes off the washing machine, you can put a zip tie around the two so the black hose cannot pop out accidentally and it is secured by the larger hose that drains. Think how much water comes out of a washing machine every single time you run that machine. Having, and this thing runs nonstop till you turn it off, so we don't want water on the floor. So putting this in the drain and then securing it with a zip tie is a very nice solution. And on my systems, the drain line is black. On other brands, it could be a different color. The red line is the water going in. And again, we have six feet of tubing, so we can reach a pretty good distance. Some people have installed these, like I said, under the sink. Some have put them by the washer dryer. Some have put them in a guest bathroom where it was near the shower. Uh, and they'd have their water connection on the sink, which I'll show you in one second. And they'd put this whole unit inside the shower or bathtub. So if it were to leak, it just leaks right into an area that's gonna drain right into the home's drain. So that's actually not a, a bad idea, especially in a, in a guest bathroom that's never being used. <clears throat> now let's talk about connecting it to your cold water. The kits that I sell come with a bunch of different fittings. And these fittings are very popular for uh, everyone, no matter what brand of RO system you use. 
And there are lots of options. So you've got what I consider the easiest, which is the hose bib connection. And uh, you know what? I keep saying I'm going to zoom in. I have all these cameras. I'm not really using them. Let me switch to this one. So this is a hose bib connection. It has a blue retaining clip on there. All my stuff has retaining clips. Sometimes you buy these, they don't come with it. And people say, well, I didn't get that clip. You don't have to have it, but it's a nice insurance. Because once your tubing has been pressed into it, that's it, it's in. You're connected. How nice is that? You can then put the retaining clip in there, and that will keep it secure. This is hard to do on camera. It's always hard to do when you've got somebody watching you. And all of you are watching. I can't do it. I could do it if I was doing this on a wall, but I can't do it right here. Nope. Anyway, that's, that's where it would go right there. This is a very snug connection. Now, one more thing I want to talk about this piece. If you want to remove it from this fitting, and any of these fittings, and this is actually an important one. A lot of people don't know how this works. You, you've got this little ring right here. And on here is another example. You've got this ring right here. Once you remove the clip, this piece here is a little bit loose. You're going to press down on that with your, your thumbnail and push the tubing in and pull out. So I'm going to press down on this with my fingers, and then I'm going to push the tubing in and pull out. <laughs> Oh God, this one really is a terrible example, but that's how it works. It presses in. This is the fitting that grabs onto the hose and it's a little tiny insert that I will remove to show you what it looks like. So here's your fitting. There's a gasket on the inside, like a garden hose. And this is the little piece that grabs on. So I just wanted you to see how that works. And this thing is what's biting onto the red tubing. When you press it in, it has little bites in there, little bits of metal. Okay. So, I love the hose bib connection. I think it's the easiest one. When you install this in your house, you want to screw it on hand tight. Do not use pliers, do not use wrenches, do not split the plastic because it's made of plastic. If you want a more durable one, you can buy one at Home Depot or Lowe's that's made of brass. That is totally fine because we are on the source water side and brass will not affect the water going into an RODI system. So if you want brass, you can do that. And then in that case, you still are gonna put a hand tight. You don't want to over wrench these things and ruin the plumbing, but that's, that's this connection. This other connection I've got here, while it's handy in front of me, this one is to meant to go under the sink where you have a cold water line and you have a hot water line. So you would, you've got a cold water line with a, a valve you twist and there's a hose going up to the sink. And you would put this right on top of that and then put the hose on top that goes up to the sink. And then here is your fitting to go to the RO system. And you would just install your red tubing in it. Pull slightly. And then let's see if I can get the clip on this guy. This might be a little bit more forgiving this time compared to the other one. Okay, so there it is, ready to go. And now what you've got is you've got cold water constantly going up to the sink, but you have the ability to shut off the water to the RO system by reaching under the sink and turning it off or open it up to send water through the line, all right? The third connection, which is my least popular or least favorite choice of connecting water to your RO system is this one here. And this is an aerator that goes on your sink's sprayer nozzle. So you've got this, this gooseneck coming into the sink and you would remove the aerator off of there, screw this on, connect this tubing by pressing it on really hard and you'll press it on. You could even heat this up in a cup of hot water and you know warm it up and then take it out of the hot water and slide it all the way on. And now it's on there. And when this is pointing down, it's making water to wash your hands. And when you turn the valve this way, it is now sending water out the side to go to the, I'm sorry, it'll send out the water out the side to go to the RO system instead. So you have this diverter, that's why it's called a diverter valve. So it's either gonna send water down to the sink or it's gonna send water out the side through the nozzle. That's the three ways that we connect our systems to our cold water source. All right, let me switch our camera again. Gotta use cold water. Don't use warm water, don't mix hot and cold together. Cold water is all you're supposed to use. The reason we use cold water is because it is the most used water in your home. Every single time you do anything in your house, you're using cold water. But there are times when you use hot water or warm water when you are taking a shower, when you are washing your hands maybe in the winter, um, when you're cleaning things like dishes, doing laundry. Uh, these are all times when we want some warm water. But for an RO system, cold water only is the absolute rule and you're never supposed to go away from it. So. The ideal temperature for water to go through one of these membranes would be 76 degrees. 
And in the winter, the water coming out of your pipes may be coming out 55 degrees instead of 76. Um, in the summer, your water might be even slightly higher than 76. It might be 80, 85. 76 is what they measure it to to get you the absolute best rejection rate of the, uh, the purity of the water coming out of the membrane. But we aren't trying to make 76 degrees all year long, okay? That's what I want you to, to know about so that way you don't make the mistake. You hook it up to the cold water line, never use hot. Never send hot water through it. The hot water actually will damage the membrane itself and it will kind of break it down and it'll, it'll have to replace it. And the membrane is probably one of the more expensive parts of the whole RODI system. So it's really important that you listen and please only use cold water. Okay, so we've got our connection to the cold water. We've got our black line into the drain. And then the third line is your pure water. So in this case, I say pure water, but really it's the water coming out of the RO system. So this is RO water. And then when the water pumps into here and comes out here, it is now DI water. And that's why we call that RO DI water. The RO water is already gonna be a lot better than what came out of your tap. And that is what we want. We want to have clean water going into our aquarium because the dirtier the water in your aquarium, the more likely you run into issues in the aquarium. So let's talk about the way the water moves through it so that way you know how yours works, if you have one already. And if you don't, you'll understand how this one works. <laughs> so this is the sediment filter. This is stage one. The water comes up the red tubing from the wall. Whether you're on a well or you're on a, um, a city water, it's still the red tubing coming up and going into the sediment filter. The sediment filter is designed to trap anything big. Its job is to keep everything else out of the rest of it, okay? Uh, all the filters on my system are five micron. Some people like to recommend that you start with like one micron, go 0.5 or go with five or go with two and then one and then 0.5. Just point, I just do five micron all the way across. And I never have customer complaints. I never have problems saying that the filters aren't working. And so I've been using the exact same filters for almost two decades. And that's what I recommend to you is just trust me and use the five microns and don't get fancy. Sediment traps the big stuff like sand, rust, things like that coming off the pipes and it'll adhere to the outside of it and water will have to pass through the center of it to go through the cap into the next area, which is your carbon. And this is a carbon block, which is this guy right here. And this is stage two, this is stage three. These are the same filters. These are two carbon blocks. So you have 20 inches of carbon that the water has to pass through before it goes up into the membrane. These three filters do one job and one job alone. They only protect the membrane. The membrane does all the work. Every time people say, hey, my numbers went up, so I changed my pre-filters my pre and it's not working right, the problem may be in here. These are just to protect the water going into here, which is the membrane. I'm gonna show you what a membrane looks like. This is a 100 gallon a day membrane. It's got um, O-rings at the end, two of them. And um, this one's 100 gallons a day. It's a 98% rejection rate, which means if your water is 100 TDS coming out of the tap, you should be getting two TDS coming out of the RO system. If yours is 200, it should be coming out four, okay? We're, we're looking for nice low numbers. We want it to catch everything. And the water actually passes through the membrane. Now the membrane is literally rolled up like one of those, uh, like one of those really pretty danishes. And they're rolled tightly. This is how you receive them, usually wrapped in plastic to protect them so they don't dry out. <clears throat> And I always recommend that if you're installing, and let's just say you have an RO system and you've never replaced the membrane, this is the perfect time to understand how this works. So I have some silicone grease here. I got this at Home Depot. And I just apply it, Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, I just, as a matter of fact, Home Depot, I think looks like a car mix where you have to flip a lid up. This one's more like a toothpaste tube. And I just apply it to the threads so that way it'll fit into the membrane housing. This is the membrane housing, which is that white thing on top. This right here is the cap you're going to remove, and inside the cap is another O-ring. So while your finger still has some silicone grease on it, I recommend that you put silicone grease on your O-ring there as well for proper maintenance while it's taken apart. Uh, if for some reason you need to replace O-rings, I have them. So we put this right back on here. And then, just so you know, sometimes when you're, everything looks right and should be working well and you've replaced everything and you're still having problems, it could be that this housing has finally failed. And what usually happens deep down inside here, it develops little cracks and water is getting past it and it's leaking out and it's not working correctly and you're getting these horrible numbers. It's because this has to be replaced. So these are not forever, but this is made of PVC and it's really durable and it's designed to handle a lot of pressure. 
When you put your membrane in, the two O-rings at the end are go in first, and then you just press it in. And that's it. Press it in. Don't hammer it in. If you cannot get it to go in for some reason, that same silicone grease in your fingers, you can rub it on the inside rim, and then you can take your membrane and slide it in, and it goes in even easier. And then you put the cap on hand tight. Now, let's say I've been running this, year, this unit for two years, and I take this off, and Mark, I can't open it. Not to mention, some people say I can't get the tubing off, like I just showed you. It's a little bit tricky when you're trying to do a demo with loose pieces. But when you've got an assembled system, it's not as hard to remove the tubing and the fittings and the clips. So I will take off the retaining clip, push in on that ring, remove the tubing. I will come over here. I'm going to do the next one. Remove that tubing. And now we've got one part of it freed up. We still have the waistline connected. So I will push on that little ring, pull the tubing out. See how nice and smooth that was compared to my demo before? All right. So here is a membrane housing fully assembled, has the membrane inside. This is our waistline. This one right here. This one, very important, the one that's offset. This is your pure line. This is the line where the blue tubing would go that's sending good water out. This is the inlet going where water goes in on mine. Water goes in as red, what comes out is good as blue, and what is waste goes out black, all right? These two fittings are not identical. <laughs> I know this sounds complicated, but I'm just explaining all this because you're like, oh, I didn't realize there was another thing. So, put this up here for a moment. And inside the pure water elbow, which is the one the blue line was on, there's an itty bitty check valve. So now we're gonna switch cameras again, see if I can show you this. So you can see this little valve in there. And if I show you the other one, it's just open. There's nothing in it. It's just water passes through because it's for the waistline. But this check valve is a one-way check valve. So water would go in, but it cannot go back out. So it's very important that you know that your check valve is installed in the right spot. And not to mix up the tubing. Now, one of the tricks I have whenever I do anything like this, working on a car, working on the stove, working on the RO system that I've never worked on before, grab your phone, take pictures of everything before you take it apart. That way you can look where all the tubes were and you can puzzle it back together without making any mistakes. And it's really easy to make a few mistakes. So I wanna emphasize either that or grab some blue tape. I love this blue masking tape. I use it all the time. And you can actually apply it here and here and even on the cap. And you can write on the blue tape black tubing, blue tubing, red tubing, so you don't make any mistakes. You won't be confused. You won't put it on backwards. You won't somehow try to put this on this direction and wonder why it's not going together right and why it looks like it's hanging off the end all of a sudden. And why doesn't this tube reach here, but this one over here, you know, the whole thing is just upside down and wrong. So that will help you a lot. Um, I'm gonna snap this back on. The next thing we wanna know is how long the membrane can last. And it used to be, everyone was told three to five years, which is nice. How long are these filters good? Six months on average. Uh, now, if you have a tiny nano tank, a little Pico tank, you could probably get a year out of them. But the point of the filters, again, protect the membrane. By replacing these every six months, like you do an air conditioner filter, you are protecting the membrane from being damaged by chlorine that comes out of the city water coming out of the pipes. So. We just change that like clockwork. Every six months, replace these three. They're not expensive. These three are $25. So it's not like it's gonna break the bank and you're protecting this membrane so it'll last as long as possible. Now I said we used to say three to five years, but things have changed in the water industry. And now my supplier says we tell people they are good from one to five years, <laughs> which is terrible. I've actually gone five, six years on a membrane with no problem where I live. But according to them, from county to county, water changes so dramatically you may not have a membrane last more than a year. It just has to be replaced annually because of where you live. Because the TDS coming out of the pipes is 800, 1500, which is insane. Where I live, it's about 175. And so I, my membranes last a good long time. But I remember the first time I opened up the housing, and that's the other thing I was leading into before. It's been on my system for a couple years and I can't open it. Oh, I can't do it, I've tried everything. I've, I've had my spouse grab the other end and we're twisting as hard as we can. You can go down to Harbor Freight or Home Depot or Lowe's and, or Amazon, and you can order some strap wrenches. And so you'd put one wrench on here, one wrench on the cap, and the two wrenches would actually pull it apart without mangling the PVC facade or uh, outer edge. It's not a facade. 
If you were to use like regular common wrenches like vice grips and channel locks, you might have bite marks all over this thing. It's gonna look kind of ugly and probably get rust marks from the metal. Not that this will ever rust, it can't, but you'll, the metal will leave the impressions and it'll look dirty and, and mangled. So two strap wrenches are really nice for getting these things loose again. And when you're putting it together, you don't use the strap wrench to tighten it. You hand tighten only, and you um, use the strap wrenches for disassembly. One last thing. Again, we're talking about a, a system that's been going for a couple of years. You finally got the cap off, and you're trying to get this out. And you watched me in this video. I just pulled it out, and it was so easy. But you're like, I can't get this to come out. What do I do? If you own some needle nose pliers, you can just grab the center and pull it right out. Okay? And when I pulled out the very first one that was used for six years, this black piece here had slid all the way down the body to the middle point. And I was like, whoa, this thing really is done. <laughs> And I didn't even know if my water was still giving me good numbers coming out, but the membrane was falling apart. So you can just take the needle nose pliers to pull it out, put your cap back on. And let's say you have a fitting that breaks in one of these spots for whatever reason. You broke it, it fell, it broke, it arrived shipping, uh, shipped to you broken. And you're like, oh no, I've got a broken fitting. Let's see, do I have the right one? Okay, so this one right here, Let's just say this was installed in here. Actually, I'll just show you. This was installed in here, and then something hit it and snapped it off to where you have half a fitting, and the threaded part is still in there. The solution would be, now I can't show it to you because I don't have a broken one, but if you have a piece in there that's threaded inside the threads, you would take a, a, a flathead screwdriver and jam it in as best you can, and then gently but forcefully twist and twist to unscrew the broken piece out. And that works every single time. Another method, if you can't do it with a flat head screwdriver, is to grab the, see how a needle nose pliers is kind of to a point and then it gets wider? You could jam in one arm really, really well into there till it spreads and bites into the plastic and then unscrew to get that piece out one twist at a time. But it may, if it strips out, it's gonna get worse and worse and worse. And you may end up having to replace the whole top piece. So I, it would be smart to just work it out. And trust me, people have had those things break off or they receive them broken. And in every unit I ship, I send the extra piece so they have it in the box so they don't have to wait another five or six days for me to send them, a new, you know, for me to send them and for the shipping to get it to them. They have it ready and they can deal with removing it with the screwdriver or the tip of the needle nose pliers to pry out the old plastic, screw in the brand new one, and they're back in operation immediately within 10 minutes. It's not a hard thing to do. And once you've done it once, you're like, oh, that was no big deal. Now, when it comes to putting on Teflon tape, I want to talk about that as well. I use high density Teflon tape and this Teflon tape, um, I buy it by the case. So I have like a million rolls and I like it a lot compared to the stuff you get at Home Depot. The, uh, this tape is a little thicker, but it's not made for gas or anything you know weird, but I can just use a few twists on each of these fittings. And what I try to do when I twist it on there I try to put it on to where it's a little bit of a volcano shape. So it's narrow at the top and then widens out as it goes down. And that way when I want to screw it in, it just goes in nice and cleanly until I have replaced my fitting that uh, was damaged. So that was that's it. And again, I hand tighten. Now if you feel the need or the urge or it hurts your hands, you can put a small screwdriver like a Phillips head in there because the shaft is very narrow. Put it in there for leverage and you can bring it around to where it faces the correct point and now it's ready to install. Okay, so those are a few tricks I wanted to share with you today. I'm gonna go ahead and put this guy back together while it's sitting here next to me, but I won't worry about the blue clips. I do wanna talk about the auto shutoff valve. I wanna talk about drinking water. I got so many things to tell you today, it's ridiculous. This is actually a very informative live stream. So we've talked about everything going on with the RO system. We haven't talked about the DI stage at all. The DI stage um, is stage number five. So you got one sediment, two carbon, three carbon, four membrane, five is a DI. I sell a kit, this is called a full set of filters. Here are your stages minus the membrane. If you need the membrane, then you just buy that separately. That's also on the website and you can replace those as needed from time to time. The DI stage, has uh, one piece of tubing coming off of it and it's on the outbound side. So I'll remove this. 
And this piece of tubing coming off the DI is uh, four feet, which usually would reach down to a barrel or a trash can to fill it up. But if you needed more tubing, if you wanted to go longer, you can go a maximum of 40 feet. No more. <laughs> 40 feet is the absolute limit because if you go beyond 40 feet, you're putting back pressure on the system and it may cause some damage to your membrane. So the general rule of thumb when it comes to RODI systems is 40 feet maximum. <clears throat> now, I don't recommend you have 40 feet of water going in and 40 feet of water going out, okay? So try to be reasonable. Usually you can get this near the source water and you just have to run the tubing about 40 feet. But some people, they wanna go up the wall, through the attic, down the wall, across a shelf, over here. I mean, they're trying to do like airline, uh, 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 I wanna say pneumatic, that's the wrong word. Uh, hydraulic tubing, that's not what this is, this is RO tubing. Just get it to the destination you get it to as short as you can and 40 feet being your maximum. Now, I don't ever recommend that you run the RODI directly into the sump of your, uh, your aquarium because it's a huge risk that if for some reason your float valve fails and continues to let water get past it, it will keep adding RO water forever until you notice. And that could mean flooding the entire room um, and definitely dropping the salinity of your reef. So it's super important. I really, really urge everyone, don't do it. It's a terrible idea. I've been telling people forever. You're always gonna have some people say, oh, I've been doing it forever and it works great. Actually, it doesn't work great. It's convenient, but it doesn't work great. And what it does is it makes your RO system turn on and off a lot. And the more this kicks on and off, the faster you burn up the membrane. RO systems are designed to run long and hard once or twice a week. Uh, matter of fact, you should at least run it once a week just to avoid stagnation issues. So let's just say we're running it once a week and we want to make 25 gallons of water. I would say turn it on, bleed out some water for 90 seconds, and I'll explain that in a second, and then start collecting your 25 gallons in a trash can, something that's food grade, that is safe, that still measures zero TDS when it's full of water, okay? If you have a dirty container and you're putting nice pure zero TDS water into that barrel because you've mixed salt water in it before, you're gonna get a higher number than zero. You've actually polluted the water for whatever got in your tank, okay? So we want a very clean container to hold the RODI water. That container needs to have a lid. That container needs a float valve. The reason we put the float valve on there is we will drill a hole through the barrel, we will run our blue tubing to it, and now the float will go up and down. And so it's gonna be hanging down, it's filling up with water, and when it finally raises high enough, it lifts up. And what happens inside this plastic thing is a little flap of rubber. That flap of rubber is putting its finger over the end of the tubing to stop water from getting in, sorta. It can't do it 100%. It can try, just like when you're washing your car and you put your thumb over the end of the hose to kind of stop the water from being wasted while you're soaping an area. And you know, you got one hand holding the hose and you're soaping the area and then you get the hose and you keep going with your washing. Water's bleeding past your thumb, you know that. You can't stop that water pressure, it will bleed past. It's gonna bleed past this, even just a few drips and with it, bleeding past, the pressure will change inside the system and this will kick on and off and on and off and on and off and on and off. And it's putting in high TDS every single time it triggers for a few seconds. So what I recommend you do is install this guy on your barrel. So it's right here. And then install this fitting right here, which is a cutoff valve that's in line. It's a ball valve. And I will show you a demonstration of that. So here we've got switch cameras again. What do we got? How about this one? So here we've got our fitting. Now there's several things going on in here. I got to move all this distraction away so you won't get lost. I'm taking this off carefully because there's pieces in here and I don't want to lose them. There's one. And then there's another one inside here. Don't want to lose that either. And then you've got this nut right here and you've got this washer. So what is going on here? You drill your hole in your trash can or your bucket. If you're just a small tank and you're using a five gallon bucket to make water, that's fine. Drill a small hole. I believe this is just under half an inch in diameter. Put the float inside. Keep the washer inside. Ideally, you want a flat spot on the, on the barrel or the bucket, but I know buckets are curved. So just kind of look at how it's all going. But you're gonna push it through and if hopefully it'll be enough that you can just go ahead and tighten this guy on there and it will seal to the barrel completely. So you tighten this all the way on and now it's holding it to the barrel. And then you've got this adjustment nut on here too, to where you can actually adjust the height of the float to wherever you need it to be in the container. So it's hanging like this. And then when the water comes up to about this far in the barrel, it lifts that much, just a small amount, right? 
then you've got your tubing that's going to go through the tightening nut and through this little, I think it's called a ferrule. So we press that on there, and you can see the direction I put it on, hopefully. See? So this thing is going to line up with the inside of this thing. So we're going to go into there, and I'm going to tighten it, right? So we push this into that fitting right there. See that little guy? That thing can pop out, so make sure it's in there. It's just a very small little piece of plastic. <laughs> I show you, oh, that can fall out, and it's holding on super well for this video. I want to show you what it looks like, so give me a second. Uh, pluck this guy out. Okay, so there's a little piece that was inside. This helps seal it into this part here. So we put that in there. We push our tubing in through the center as far as it will go. That thing was acting weird. Okay, so now we've got our three pieces on the tubing. We push this in, make sure that this is all the way down to the threaded part. Push this down with our fingers to here. There we go. And then we'll take our, our hand nut and we'll tighten it down until it grabs tight. Don't need any wrenches. This is all hand tight plumbing. So now we've got this holding onto a barrel or a trash can, and we've got blue tubing coming out. This can be whatever length you want. I'm just going to leave it this length because why not? Then we've got our inline ball valve. So we'll remove our clip, put this on here. And then on the other side, we will put our DI tubing, the tubing coming off the DI stage. And now we've got DI water going through the tubing into the valve to the float. And the float would be installed. And then once the barrel is full, you can just go over here and just close the valve and you're done. And you don't have to open it again until you need to. And if you need to disconnect it, you can disconnect it at this fitting. And you can go put that barrel away. <laughs> so you don't have to have this connected all the time forever to everything. But, and so it's very convenient, especially if you have like a, a barrel you use for your water changes. And you have the float valve permanently installed in the barrel. But you are not going to keep the barrel by the RODI system. So you can just disconnect the barrel, you can rinse out the barrel, flip it upside down, let it sit outside in the weather until it's time to use it again. And then when it's time to use it, you would just reconnect it to your ball valve. Now your barrel is plumbed in again, and you can open the valve to start making water and collecting it in a barrel. And the benefit of the float is it keeps your floors dry, and that's why we use float valves, and I highly recommend them. Of course, I have those on my website as well. All right, so that is actually a super important stage. I recommend this for everyone. I normally don't make it this long. I would trim it way down to something very close to the barrel. So that's usually what it looks like on my system. On all my systems, every I've got a system under the reef that's 43 gallons. I've got one on the frag system that's like, I don't know, 12 gallons. And then the huge ROD, uh, the huge water mixing station that thing has a float inside of it and it's got one of these cutoffs. And that way I can actually open the valve to whichever one I want to fill up and I can close one if I want to isolate it. Now, the only one I close is the one to the saltwater vat. The, um, the two other ones, they're almost always open. Now, if I need to make salt water in a hurry, I will close the other two so that the water has to go to the big one first. And so having these inline ball valves is super handy. I do sell them. Okay, that part's done. So we've installed everything. We understand how it all works. How do we use it the first time? The very first time, brand new out of a box, when you turn, when you hook it all up, I would say get this mounted on the wall like I described, hook up the good water to your red tubing, install the black line in the waste, install the blue line, actually put the blue line in a bucket and turn this on minus the DI, okay? No DI stage right now. We just wanna turn this on, let it run for a solid hour. The reason we do that is the food grade preservative in the brand new membrane has to be thrown away you don't want that getting into your tank or into your mixing station or anywhere, and you definitely don't want to drink it. You're going to spend an hour making water that you're going to throw away or throw it on your lawn, wash your car, throw it in the washing machine to use toward the next load of laundry. But do not use any of the brand new membrane water the first time you turn it on or the first time you replace the membrane. When you put that brand new one in, like I showed you whatever it was 15 minutes ago, that first hour you turn it on, you let it run to push out the food grade preservative, then you can hook up the DI stage, and now you can make RO and DI water, okay? 
Okay, next thing I want you to know, um, the reason my systems are not sold as one solid one like some other brands is because the, I want you the ability to make drinking water. You already spent a lot of money to have RO DI water in your home. Well, you should be able to benefit from that besides just your aquarium. And if you have a spouse and like, oh, you're always buying stuff for the tank. <laughs> this is for us, honey. <laughs> this will let us have really nice water for coffee, tea, cooking, whatever you want to use it for. Um, the RO water is very drinkable. It's very, it's actually very tasty. And DI water is not drinkable. I don't recommend it. This is a huge, God, people debate this stuff all the time. I've read the debates. I'm sick of the debates. I'm telling you, drink the RO water. Don't drink the DI water. DI water is so pure, it tastes bad in your mouth. And if you have metal fillings for some reason, it, it tastes like you have tin foil in your teeth. So you don't ever drink the DI water. Can you die from drinking DI water? Yes, if you're in the middle of a desert and you haven't had a drop of water or food in three weeks and you came across a jug of DI water and you drank it, it would deplete the last of your electrolytes and you would die, yes, because you were in the middle of a desert and you had to end a drop of anything in three weeks. If you are a normal human being that drinks water, tea, scotch, hot chocolate, and eats food that has liquid in it to make it tasty, <laughs> If you were to drink some DI water, it will not kill you, okay? Because you have plenty of electrolytes from all the other food and drinks and food and drinks you consume. So having a glass or two of DI water will not hurt you. It will not destroy any part of your organs. Don't believe the lies, okay? But it doesn't taste good, so why do it? So I say drink the RO water. Now, how do you do that? Inside my system, I include a T fitting. The T fitting goes between the RO system and the DI system and then you run a, an extra tube with a cutoff valve on the end. So we'll just do a, a miniature demonstration here of what I'm trying to do. I'll just start cutting some tubing here. <laughs> All right, so we want to go roughly to here, right? Are you guys bored to death? I hope you find this interesting because it's actually important stuff and a lot of people don't know this stuff. Or they find out the hard way later on. So I just cut off a lot of that tubing because I'm going to use it for the T. And we're going to need one more small little piece. And I'm going to move those filters out of the way so you can see better because I know I'm kind of hiding behind my filters. I'm going to press this on here. I want to make sure it's on. It feels like it's not. Oh, it was. All right. Then we put our other little piece of tube on the other side. We'll press this into the DI stage. And then you can put all the little blue retaining clips. Let me move these out of the way. Then we have this piece of tubing coming out, which I said would go into your barrel of water. So we'll put the... The normal cutoff is what I put on there if I'm not using a float. So like if you just want to put this in whatever container you're using, you have an on-off valve right here to stop the flow of water when you're ready, okay? I know it looks a little weird. It's got some threads that confuses some people. It's because it's designed for a bladder tank, but it's a really nice cutoff, and so I use that instead of a straight inline cutoff. So this guy can actually sit on the edge of a bucket and do a pretty good job of staying put. But you can just drop it down inside, open the valve, and you're making water in there. The other line that we put in here in the T this is our drinking water line, and it's also our TDS creep line, which is so important and I feel like is so underused by so many people that just don't know. So we've installed a second line. This is our RO, RO line, and I've closed the tubing. Okay. So I, I'm going to summarize again, even though I know I'm being redundant. I apologize. RO system is hooked up to cold water. The black line is in the waste. We've got our blue tubing going to the DI, and both of the valves coming out of the DI and the RO are closed. When it's time to make water for the day, you're like, I need to make water. I want to make drinking water to make iced tea. I want to make tank water for my reef. What you're going to do is you're going to open this valve first and put it in something. Uh, I actually use a glass vase. I just stick it on the top of the washing machine. And I put it in there, and I set a timer for 90 seconds. Do not forget to set the timer. <laughs> I cannot tell you. Hundreds of times I have forgotten because I didn't set a timer 
and I'd have water running down the washer and across the tile floor because I was doing the tedious creep thing and forgot because I got distracted for one second, which turned into 18 minutes. So I set a timer on my watch and I tell it, uh, I say set timer for 90 seconds and then I can walk away and my wristwatch is vibrating to constantly remind me, go back and close this valve. Now, why am I doing this? Because when you first turn this on after it's been off for 20 minutes, two hours, or one week, the TDS that comes out of here is very high. So you have water coming from the city, let's say it's 200. And the water that's sitting in the membrane, even though it's just in there, like I said, it could be a brief duration. It could be you turned it off and it was off for like 20, 30 minutes. And you're like, oh, I need to make a little more water. You're still gonna get that TDS creep. You're gonna have a bunch of TDS come off the membrane. It just wicks off of it and sits inside the housing. And all that water in there, it needs to come out for the 90 seconds. Let me grab that vase. So here's my base. I've put my, my uh, cutoff in there and I've turned it on. I set my timer for 90 seconds. And after 90 seconds, I have about this much water in here, maybe about half, which means really I have three minutes. <laughs> but 90 seconds, it fills up to about here. My wristwatch is vibrating. I can close this valve and now I can make water for the reef, okay? What I've done is I flushed all the high TDS out of the membrane and into here and I'm throwing away that much water, which is whatever that is, eight ounces of water, it's not, you're not being wasteful. Some people wanna have something called a flush valve where they bypass behind the, the uh, flow restrictor in the back. They have this weird valve in the back and they're like, I don't know what this does. I'm not even sure if it should go this way or this way. I always get that confused or, or you'll hear, oh my God, it's been like that for two weeks. The flush valve on the back of the membrane, if yours came that way, should be open for 15 seconds and closed. You literally stand there and go 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, to 15 and close the valve. If you're doing it my way, you don't have to do any valves. You just have to open this up, wait 90 seconds. And if you're using a TDS meter like this one, like I do, you can now see your numbers nice and low and it's ready to either collect and make drinking water or you can use it to make DI. So it's very important you always do that every single time. Um, I have articles about TDS creep, I have videos about TDS creep, but what happens if you were to watch the meter as it's happening, as it's running, you will see the, um, the you'll see the number go from, like let's say the meter says zero at first or, or four, and suddenly it's like 90, 115, 172, 198, and then it, it, as quick as it got to that high number, it comes down just as fast and finally gets down to that low number, like I said, of two or four. So you want to make sure that that big spike, that 100, that 200 that happened for one minute doesn't go into here and just erode this DI resin because it will. <laughs> Every time you turn on the system, it erodes it. Now, if you had this tubing going to a float valve in your sump and the sump is calling for water every two hours, every single time this triggers on, it sends the TS creep straight into the DI and the DI is suck, sucking it out. So remember, we wanna have zero coming out of the DI. You've got 200 shooting in all of a sudden. It takes it out, but you'll watch the resin change color rapidly because it just dealt with so much uh, TDS. And then it comes out zero, which you're happy about, and it goes into your reef. But what happens is it is wiping out the DI resin so quickly because it triggered on and off 10 times a day instead of only being on briefly like I said, once or twice a week. That's why I don't recommend you go straight to your sump, but to actually collect into a separate barrel. Now, when I was making drinking water the old fashioned way with an actual one gallon pitcher that you put in the fridge, I would do my 90 second thing. And then I'd move this into my pitcher and I'd fill up, you know, I'd set my timer for, I guess it was eight minutes and my one gallon would be full. I'd close the valve and now I'd make the reef water because now I knew it couldn't get any lower. It's been already running for eight or 10 minutes. At this point, it's the lowest it'll be. Now I can start making DI water and send it to the reef, to the uh, top off container. And it'll run for like the next two or three hours to fill up as much water as I need for the reservoir. My reservoir holds 43 gallons. So it might take, I don't even know, I guess four, five, six hours to fill that up. And then it's full and it's not, it's never completely empty. I always have about this much water left before I turn it on. So, you know, I'd say five hours or so. It's usually filled it to the top, the float activates. 
and it puts back pressure on the line and my RO system kind of makes this weird vibration sound and I, I can hear it. I'm like, what's that sound? I'm like, oh yeah, and I go turn this off. The easiest way to turn it off is to close the valve. But um, that's my method and if you want to copy it, by all means, please do. If you are letting it trigger on and off repeatedly um, several times a day in the application of using it directly to the sump, the membrane will wear out much sooner. The DI gets wasted, as I mentioned before. So your the DI is $30 a cartridge unless you're packing it yourself with loose powder or loose resin beads. And then the membrane will cost you $30, $50, $70, depending on what you're using. And these add up. So do you want to spend $100 or do you want to spend 90 seconds avoiding TDS creep to protect everything so it lasts much, much longer? Now I want to talk to you about the DI resin. On the front of every DI resin I sell is a formula that I've included on the label that will help you use math to determine how long this should last. A DI resin cartridge um, is packed with something like, oh, I don't know, about a pound of resin, maybe a pound and a half. And these are actually packed for me. I don't do this. I, I get them shipped to me in the plastic. I put my label on there like I do all my other stuff. And uh, so I never have to deal with this. If you are packing these yourself, you should be very careful that you don't, because you're gonna spill some resin on the floor and it's little glass beads, like miniature marbles, and you could slip and fall. So keep that in mind, you wanna be careful. The resin should be packed in here. So as you're putting it in with a funnel and you're carefully adding it into your, your housing, you would then take it and drop it about one inch repeatedly to make the resin fall, to put more in so it's filled to the top and then you screw on the top and that's done. I only sell it this way so you never have to do that. But some people like to pack their own. There's an arrow in the front which means this side up, please don't install this way. If you install it like this, no water comes out of the blue tubing. <laughs> so you gotta make sure that it's right side up and then water will flow. And what happens is the water goes into the housing and around the outside and then it goes up through the bottom through these holes and through the resin to go out the top and then come out the cap and go out the blue tubing to go out. So if your housing isn't full of water for some reason, if it's only half full or a third, especially in the winter when it's really cold or when you've been making a lot of water and it looks half empty, don't worry, the water has to exit through the resin to get out. So it's doing its job. But then this is a mixed bed resin. Some people have a separate, they have a cation cartridge and they have an anion cartridge and they will set them up to where water goes into one and then goes into the next one. So they separate them because they feel that lasts longer. The ones I sell are more simple. It's cation anion combined together. It's two colors. And then when you uh, use it, it will gradually turn orange all the way to the top. And that is merely a visual indicator that your resin is being consumed. It does not mean it's gone. So if you turn this on for the first time and it changed like an inch instantly, you're like, oh my God. Well, you might've put the food grade preservative through it. <laughs> um, it could be your TDS is really high in your area and it's still coming out pretty high out of the membrane, which is why you need the meter to measure but it doesn't mean it's ruined. It just means part of it changed color. I had one cartridge that turned completely orange and lasted me almost a year because my TDS is actually low, but the resin got used up somehow look wise, color wise. But as long as it kept coming out in zero, I kept using it and it was zero for a super long time. You may find that these only last you four to five months or it could last you eight or nine months or it could be lucky and it lasts you a year or longer but you only replace this when it's consumed based on TDS numbers. So owning a TDS meter lets you know if this is working. And remember, we don't wanna just take our, our glass and scoop it out of the barrel and measure that TDS. You wanna hold the tubing, that the water literally coming out over your clean dry cup, get a clean sample and measure that. And then if you want, you can scoop out of your barrel and you can measure that and just see if your barrel is polluted and needs to be cleaned with a bleach water solution. I mentioned at the very beginning of this live stream. Okay, so like I said, if you want to use that formula on the label, you can. Uh, it's a very specific uh, formula, and you would determine all these numbers, crunch the math, and then you might find out that your uh, DI cartridge should last you 275 gallons, or it might last you 897 gallons, or it may last you even higher. The lower the TDS coming out of the membrane going into here, the longer this lasts. The higher it comes out of here, the quicker this is consumed. So I can't tell you how often to change this. It's based on changing numbers. Some people want to have two DIs in a row, and I've never understood that. 
unless you're not at home. For example, if you travel a lot and you're not gonna be there for two or three weeks, or if you are a maintenance guy that visits a tank once every two weeks or once a month to do work, you're obviously not gonna be there to check on the RO system day after day after day. In those scenarios, yes, you would have two DI housings. So you've purified the water and then you uh, polish off the last of the TDS with your DI, but because you're only gonna see it once in a blue moon, you put two to guarantee it's coming out zero. But if you are a regular hobbyist that lives in the house with the aquarium and you're dealing with your tank every single day, when this is used up, you can see it on your meter like, oh, I'll take the wrench, I'll remove the housing, I'll put a new DI in and close the housing. It didn't take you 90 seconds to do that. There's no reason to have a second one here and leave the first one still in there dirty or consumed because as this one gets wiped out, it has the potential of actually sending some of its excess TDS from the completely consumed DI into the new one, burning up the second one more rapidly. So it's much better to just change that when it's time. I've never run double and I have a huge system here at my house and I just run the one and then I swap it out. And like I said, I'm swapping it about once a year, maybe, maybe a little sooner. I remember a time period in the past where I was having to run my, um, I was replacing the DI like every five months. And I was like, all right, that's the cost of doing business. That's what it costs for my reef. And I just change it every five months. But uh, things have gotten better in my city. I run a system with a booster pump, which is the next thing I wanna talk about. And the booster pump makes a big difference too. So why don't we talk about that now? We're done with this part. And then we're gonna talk about pressure gauges too, because that is very important when it comes to a booster pump. Now, um, different RO systems will have a um, pressure gauge somewhere on the unit and the tubing may somehow go into that gauge. It might be somehow mounted on the front or in the metal. Mine is usually installed on a black fitting and with Teflon tape, I'm just holding this up for the video. And you would install right there. And so you would see the pressure of the membrane. We're not trying to see the pressure of the whole system. And we definitely want the pressure of the DI. We want the pressure that's inside the membrane housing. So the water's going in, the needle will move. We wanna be a minimum, a minimum of 40 PSI. That is the operational lowest level for this membrane that's recommended. And we can go up as much as we want to 75, 85, even I've seen people run it at 100, it's okay. Once you go past 100, you can get a little nervous. But the PVS, the, the PVS, the PVC housing can handle the pressure way better than the acrylic housings. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is because when you install a booster pump to your RO system, a lot of people want to install it on the red line. They want to put the red line, the, the source water into the booster pump, come out of the booster pump and go straight into the first housing, second housing, third housing, this, and then finally to the DI. And that is the wrong way to install it because these acrylic housings are more brittle than the PVC housing on top. So the way you're supposed to do it, you leave your cold water installed to the wall that goes to the three acrylic housings. And then where it comes up out of the last housing, it goes into the booster pump and out of the booster pump into the membrane. And that way you're putting the pressure where you need it at the membrane and not on this part where these could actually crack, shatter and rupture like a little hand grenade. So we definitely don't want to put the booster pump in the wrong spot. And I know some people that have it in the wrong place. So please make your corrections. The booster pump has to be plugged in. So it has a power supply and this plug has to be into an outlet that's on all the time. So for, I've got so many things on the table here. Let me declutter a little bit. Because I want to show you some stuff. Okay. Uh, the booster pump itself, the one I sell is Puro Max. It's got a rubber cap on each side that you remove and throw away. They're gone forever. This is just to protect it while it's in shipping. So if you ordered a booster pump kit, you would be getting this pump. And you'll notice there's arrows right here showing you the flow of water. Water's going in here and out this side, okay? This booster pump would then come with, I love these elbows. They're much nicer than what I used to use. Teflon tape on these, of course. And then you would screw them in on each side. So I'm just doing a demonstration without uh, Teflon. 
And this bracket that this booster pump is on has four holes on it, so it can actually be screwed to the wall. And you could mount it on the wall this way if you wanted. Um, I don't think it matters if it's upside down, but I've never seen anyone do it upside down. <laughs> so I, I'm not 100% positive, but mine are mounted on my RO system like this. But if you're doing an accessory add-on to an RO system, you can mount it to the wall, and then the water would go in where the arrow is, showing water's going in. So this is the red water, the red line going from the carbon into the booster pump, going out of the booster pump, and then the tubing would continue into the membrane housing. Now I talked about this power supply being plugged in all the time. This is supplying power to the booster pump and if there's a plug under your sink, it's probably for your garbage disposal and that plug is only turned on when you flip on the switch to run the garbage disposal. So even though you see a second outlet, it's dead until you flip on the switch. And odds are you're not gonna unplug your garbage disposal to turn on your booster pump to make some water. So you need a different outlet or you have to run an extension cord from this to wherever your source power is so this can have power all the time. The booster pump comes with this pressure switch that has water going in and coming out. And this one here doesn't have any arrows on it. It doesn't care which direction the water goes through it. So you can install it however you want, but you're gonna have the water going through it on each side. And this is being installed on the outbound blue line so in the case of RODI, I'm trying to think how to explain this to you. I think I'll switch cameras again. Gonna have to do the long distance shot, sorry guys. This pressure switch will be installed on the blue line coming out of the auto shutoff valve. And when you close the line coming out of here, and you've got this line here, the drinking water line closed as well, it puts back pressure on the system, which will trigger the switch, which turns off your booster pump. So you don't have to plug it in and unplug it all the time. When the booster pump pressure switch is installed in the correct spot, as the entire system pressurizes when you're done making water, and I need to specify what I mean by pressurize, you're leaving the cold water turned on all the time. So there's water going in, and you close the lines going out so no water can exit, it will pressurize. And because it pressurizes, it, it actually affects this thing, which is your auto shutoff valve. There's a piston inside there that moves forward, stops the flow of water. That pressure switch notices the change and turns off the booster pump. So it's completely automated. It's a really nice thing to have installed. And I've been running mine for a very long time. I do have this horrible diagram. If one of you guys is really good at doing some kind of CAD, I'd love to have someone make me a, a real picture. <laughs> That looks nice because I don't have I don't know how to do that and I would love to put that nice graphic on my website That's easier to follow so someone if they're trying to do a DIY situation they could um, But the auto shut off valve is really important and a lot of systems come with this a lot of people don't even know what this thing is it's Like I don't know what that thing is. It's got four tubes going in it And this is another one of the things you need to know all about on the FAQ section of my website I explain it. I have a video just about this piece. There are four holes on there like I said for water to go in and out there's also stamped into the plastic in and out so it matters which way the water is going through here and it also matters if you can see the screws or not everything matters you cannot just put it in there and say it'll be fine there are four ways of installing it only one is right <laughs> I think so on mine the screws face you so that means it's correct and the in is where water is going in from the pre filters and it goes out into the membrane it comes out of the membrane, it goes into it again, and comes out, and goes to the drinking water and, the R and to the DI water. Auto shutoff valves are cheap, they're like 10 bucks. They don't last forever. If you have to replace one every couple of years, don't be surprised. Okay, how are we doing on time? Wow, we've been talking for more than an hour. I said, oh, I bet I have an hour's worth to talk about. And I still have more things in my head that I wanna tell you. Um, let's talk about automating your drinking water. So, You've got your system set up, you've got your T-line in here, you've got your, your bleed to waste away um, the TDS creep for 90 seconds, and now you wanna run it to your refrigerator to make drinking water and ice cubes uh, to make ice, and you also wanna have a line going to your DI to make uh, water for top off, as well as to mix it with salt to make salt water. When you decide to do that, Unfortunately, 
the pressure going in here, even if you have nice high TD, uh, high, nice high PSI, it's not enough or it's not fast enough to feed directly from this into a refrigerator. So even though you've got the cold water full, 100% open, going into this, and you think, oh, it'll just, I can put a glass in there and fill it up, it's gonna be super slow because it's coming out very slowly. I forget how many, how much it is per minute, but you're making a, a gallon between eight and 11 minutes. So how long does it take to make one glass of water? You can do some math if you want. I, I can't remember. I did that a long time ago. I can't remember, but it, you're standing there like 90 seconds holding a glass, which is insane. So, and also if you're not using the drinking water, you're like, I just want to use it for the ice maker. You'll find that all the ice cubes are half the size because it goes in so slowly that it fills up to a certain point and shuts itself off because of some timer built into the refrigerator. And you have all these weird ice cubes or hollow ice cubes, like what's going on? Wasn't enough pressure. So in the situation of using an RO system to make drinking water, to make ice cubes on your fridge, you need something called a bladder tank, which looks a lot like those propane bottles that you use to run a grill. And you get this one, it's a three gallon bladder tank. You install everything into your home and you put the bladder tank somewhere near the sink typically under the sink, and you run your tubing to the bladder tank. And then from that, it's, it's a weird thing. Again, I need somebody to do this drawing for me. <laughs> so if somebody's volunteering, please send me an email. Um, the water is going to go to the bladder tank. The tank itself has a, a bladder, a piece of rubber. Think of a whoopee cushion inside there. And as this fills up with RO water, the cushion is compressed down more and more and more. And then finally, there's enough back pressure from all that water inside that container that it puts back pressure and shuts off the RO system temporarily through the auto shutoff valve. Now, that one line that water goes in, water has to come out again. It's gonna feel weird to you. It's sort of like an anemone has a mouth and a butt in the same hole, right? <laughs> so you got water going into the bladder tank and the water has to come out the same bladder to go to the ice maker or to a spigot on the countertop. Um, and in those situations, you will end up using a bunch of T-fittings. So you've got your line that comes from the RO system and goes behind the cabinets, behind the refrigerator, down to the bladder tank. <clears throat> and then you will put a, a line, you'll put a T into that line, and this goes to the spigot. You put another T in the line, this goes to the ice maker and the fridge door. <clears throat> and that's how you end up getting water on demand through the bladder tank, because as you hold the spigot in or as the ice maker demands some water, it's grabbing some water from the bladder. The bladder's deflate or expanding wider, forcing the water rapidly into wherever you need water from. And you get your ice cubes or you get your drinking water. And then after a while, the bladder tank is so low it needs to be refilled, you turn on the RO system to replenish it. Um, I don't actually set, well, yeah, I don't set mine up to be all the time, every minute of the day. I let my, I just kind of, that's how I run it. But there's one more thing you need. And that's this cute little check valve that came from China that actually has an arrow on it and it has a typo on it. <laughs> it says check valves. I don't know why there's an S on there because you only get one. <clears throat> but you send the line from your RO water. So that check line would be right here. And then it goes to the bladder tank way under the sink. And that way the bladder cannot push water back into the RO system. So the check valve is very important. It's inexpensive. It's part of the drinking water kit I sell. So if you order a kit, you get the bladder tank, you get the spigot, you get the check valve, you get a couple other things, you get some more tubing, you get all the toys you need to actually set it up to make it automated to where you have nice, clean, crystal clear ice cubes and you have nice drinking water right at the kitchen counter where you can fill up uh, a glass of water like I do all the time or where you can make uh, water for coffee or for making tea or maybe you have one of those kettles that heats up water. I always use that to, I use that pure you know, RO water to make the, the heated water for like hot chocolate and stuff. That is the end of my list, I think. I'd love to answer some of your questions. <laughs> and um, there are some other fittings in here I didn't even talk about. So if you're thinking about doing questions or if you've already been doing it, make sure you put at Mila's Reef so I can find your questions and I'll answer them. One more thing I didn't talk about that's in the collective group of parts is this thing here, <clears throat> which is a kit that has, um, it's a drain valve, drain saddle valve. And this piece here would fit around the PVC pipe under your sink. So if you were installing this under a sink and you wanted to send the waistline, you don't want to take the waistline out of the cabinet and put it into the hole in the top of the sink. You want to run it right into the waste. You would put this on the down pipe that's under the sink. 
and you drill a small hole, insert the tubing into it, bolt it on, and then every time you turn on the RO system, the wastewater goes into here. And when you move away, you leave this on the house. You don't take this off. It just it stays with the house. Um, and then the wrench itself, I want to talk about that as well. Believe it or not, this thing has an arrow on it <laughs> to tell you which way to use it. And the wrench would just go on your housing, and you would just twist it to loosen your item, and then you unscrew it. And when you're doing this, it's full of water. So be careful because it's going to want to slosh. What I do is as soon as I've taken it off of my bracket, I move it over slightly and I try to lift this up to remove some of the displacement. And that way I'm not, because if I just have it like this, it's full of water and as I'm moving, it's just splashing everywhere. But lift it, it removes the displacement and I can walk to the sink, dump out the water, replace the DI, put it back in place. Inside here, I think I just dropped it, <clears throat> is another O-ring. This O-ring is very important. You want to make sure that it has been greased with the silicone grease, and you want to inspect it when you remove your housing to replace any of the filters, whether it's the sediment, the carbons, or the DI. And if it looks flat, like it's smashed down because you overdid it, you can take it out and flip it upside down and use it a little bit longer, and in the meantime, order new O-rings. <clears throat> when you put the housing back on, you just drop your filter in there, you put it back into place, you screw it on, and you screw it hand tight. You don't use the wrench. The wrench is just like an oil filter wrench on the car. You use the wrench to remove it. You don't use the wrench to put it back on. You don't need this to be bolted on so hard that they won't come off later six months from now. So it, everything's hand tightened, and then when it's time to remove, you use the wrench. And I keep mine near mine all the time, so I know where it is. Okay. I think I've talked about all the components that I wanted to talk about today. <clears throat> yeah. Let me have a sip of coffee and I'll look at your questions. That coffee's cold. What happened? How long have I been talking? All right. Let me move this stuff. I'm, I'm going to put this down before it falls. It is my hope that you learned something new today. If you have a problem with your RO system and you need help, the first thing I always tell people to do is contact the manufacturer that made it. So if you have an ice cap one, you contact ice cap. If you have a SpectraPure, you talk to SpectraPure. If you got one from BRS, you talk to BRS. If you have one from me, obviously talk to me. That's what I always recommend. However, if for some reason you need to um, get help with one that's not when I sell, you can still ask. I'll still try to help you. And <clears throat> in Club Milo's Reef, you can go ahead and you can ask your questions there and people will chime in. And they will give you a lot of opinions. And they will, t I mean, like Mike McNamee, he's one of our moderators. He has the craziest RO setups going that I know of right now. And it's got like so many housings, so many things happen, so many flow restrictors. It, it, he's just taken away over the top and he's super proud of himself. <laughs> So don't let him scare you, Mike. Don't scare these people. Um, it is possible to do it more simply. I'm not saying make it super so simple that you can't, you know, that it, it's for dummies. There's some basics. There's a lot of information on this channel about RO systems. I have a playlist with about six or seven videos specifically that talk about how to install it, how to repair it, um, how things work. And I even have a video showing a tour that's about 15 or 17 minutes where I, it's called like get the most of your RODI system and I demonstrate everything including TDS creep and the bladder tank and the ice maker and all that stuff where you can actually see where all the tubes went if that's interesting to you. Okay, I want to try something new. So like I said to you guys to use the at Mila's Reef, we're going to see, I noticed recently they added a search box in the chat here for me. So I want to see, oh my god that's amazing. <laughs> It put them all together and I don't have to see the rest of the chat. I love this. Okay, cool. Uh, Pop Reef asked forever ago. <laughs> you got banned from Reef Central? What happened? Uh, yeah, I got banned for an April Fool's Day joke that you can read about on reefaddicts.com. So just go to Google, type in Reef Addicts, type in April Fool's, type in Milev and hit enter and you'll find it. <clears throat> Um, 
Louise says, glad you found some, st your reef found some stability. You should try to do this for 365 days straight. Well, that's kind of what I was thinking. I was thinking doing the diary for an entire year, but then I was thinking that's a long time. And that's also, um, there's gonna be some repetition in there, which could become boring for any viewer. I mean, who tunes in every single day for the exact same tank? Usually that's why you have your own at home, but it is kind of my thought process. Uh, Luca says, what about cleaning the auto top off reservoir? That's just like cleaning the, uh, the, the barrel of salt water or the, or the actual uh, DI water collecting vessel that you use. If you had brute trash cans, for example, or poly tanks, if you have a top off reservoir, you can definitely take it out, clean it with bleach water, wipe it all down. You can use vinegar and water too, if you want, wipe it all down and then let it air dry. And um, if you're using vinegar, just rinse it really well and air dry it. If you're, I don't know if I want to use bleach water and acrylic. I've never done it, so I'm going to imagine that's a bad idea. <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to throw bleach on acrylic and see what happens. I just know better, right? But um, I'd use bleach water on poly tanks, you know, the white poly or the brute trash cans or any you know, of those plastic type vessels. But when it comes to acrylic, I like to use vinegar and water for cleaning. Um, you could use something else like citric acid if you wanted and, and water, that won't hurt the acrylic. And you can just rinse everything really well, wipe it all down, it's brand new pristine, and then start using it again. My top off container that's been under this tank now for coming up on three years, replaced one that was under this tank for about seven years. And when I put my, when I took a sample of water out of there, cause I never put my hand in there. I only put in my hand just long enough to install the top off pump. Once the pump is in there, I, I'm good to go. I, I don't have to put my hand in there for any reason whatsoever. So when I'd measure it, it was like one. And that was after seven years. I'm like, I don't need to clean this thing at all. But if you find that yours is getting dirty or something spilled into it, a dosing pump leaked, um, somehow you back siphoned water into it because something was set up wrong, yeah, you're gonna have to clean it out and get it pure again. Otherwise, whatever pollutants are in that reservoir will just put polluted water into your system every time you top off. Terry says, love the shirt. Thanks, Terry, I appreciate that. Um, you know, when I first made these, I told you it was a joke and all that stuff, and it was funny to me, but I never wore it because <laughs> I didn't want to promote them. And that was, the, that was the whole thing. So when the concept of the T-shirt was discussed behind the scenes, I can't remember who said it. I don't know if it was me or someone else that was a friend of mine said, they should make a shirt that says I've been banned. Because what had happened was I was at a trade show in California, like Max or Rifa Palooza, it was probably Max. And in the show, everyone would walk up and say, hey, Milev, I love your, your thread, but I got banned from Reef Central. I mean, I had so many people say, hi, I'm banned, that I was like, they need a t-shirt. <laughs> they need a shirt. And the thing is, it's kind of ridiculous to sell someone a shirt that says I'm banned because now they're wearing a billboard on their chest about a place that they're not allowed to go to or a place that they're mad at. I mean, you know, who wears a t-shirt that promotes a different religion, for example, you know? I mean, it just makes no sense. And I thought, that's hilarious. Make a shirt, they have to buy it, they're promoting the website they hate or that kicked them out, that's insane. I'm gonna do this. And so I ordered like 36 shirts as a joke for the next time I was in California for another show. And I had them in the booth and people would walk by and they just grab one. You're like, oh, it's free, free t-shirts. Like, no, you gotta pay for that. I'm like, well, how much is it? I was like, it's 20 bucks. Well, you know, cause I think that's what it cost me for these shirts, you know, with a shirt and the printing and everything. I don't know. But they're like, oh, I'm not paying that. I'm like, it's fine. I didn't, it wasn't for you anyway. Are you banned? I'm like, well, no. I'm like, why do you want it? <laughs> so anyway. I had these shirts in my booth. If I was making three or five dollars on them, uh, what a horrible person I am to profiteer off of this concept. I just thought it was insanely funny and so I wanted to do this, but I got yelled at for it after the show was over. You know, Reef Central said, you can't do that and that was wrong. And I was like, I think it's funny. I, we talked about it in the group. I just went ahead and did it. Like you should have asked first. And I was like, well, I didn't want you to say no. <laughs> So I made these shirts, but then after I got yelled at, I just put them in the closet and never thought about them again. And I was, you know, every couple of years I'm in, I'm in, you know, clean out mode. I'm like, oh, those shirts are still here. 
I better not sell them because I got yelled at from Reef Central, but I can definitely give them away. So I just want to give them away to people that deserve them, <laughs> people that, that, that understand it. And at this point, it's been so long, I don't feel like I'm promoting anything. So it's, you know, it's just funny. So I put it on. This is probably the first time I've worn one in a decade. Oh, thank you, Alex. Uh, that was one thing that bounced around my head three different times as I was talking. And I was so busy in the concept and the, the theme of that exact moment. I didn't mention this. He said, what about a water softener? Where do you install it in the house? When the house has a water softener in it, you want your water softener to be first and the RODI system second because the, R the water softener will do all the hard work and take out all the water hardness, basically. I and mean, that's what his job is. And the RO system has much less work to do its job. So anytime someone says, I've got this problem, and I'm like, do you have a water softener? I'm like, yes, install it after the water softener, and everything you're complaining about will probably take care of itself. So yes, those are wonderful to have. Sometimes you're in an area where you absolutely need one. I personally don't like water softeners because it's weird. Uh, when I visit some people's homes or <laughs> even family, some of my family members have water softeners and you take a shower and you're, it just feels like the soap is still on you. And I'm like, it won't get off and I'm in the shower too long trying to get the, <laughs> it's just slippery water, it's weird. Um, so where I live, I don't, I don't need it. But if I was in an area like Arizona where the TDS is like 1500 coming out of the pipes, I'd probably have a water softener. Um, there's parts of the world where you just have to have one because otherwise it destroys things in your home. And so they install it on the whole house. And when it's on the whole house, then anywhere you hook up your RO system will be protected by the water softener. Pop Reef said, I never knew about the cold water only in RODI. So let me talk about that. Um, I already explained one part, but I didn't explain another part. Remember I said the temperature could be different in the winter. So if you have, I don't have the membrane anymore because I put it in here. Take it out and put it in my hand again. A 100 gallon a day membrane can produce 100 gallons, which is 4.16 gallons per hour, when the temperature is 76 degrees going through it, when the TDS is less than 200, and when your PSI is 60. Okay, so if you have all three of those parameters perfect, you will make 4.16 gallons per, uh, per hour. Yeah, that's right to make 100 gallons in a day. In the winter, when the water's coming out of your pipe is so cold that it's like 55 degrees, 50 degrees, something like that, a 100 gallon a day membrane becomes a 50 gallon a day membrane. And suddenly your production has just cut in half. Your system's not broken, the filters are not ruined, the membrane's not damaged. It's just so cold, the membrane is cut in half. It actually is slower. Still making water, just not making as fast as you used to. So where I live, we don't get crazy cold winters like some of you guys do up north. And so when my water's coming out of the pipes colder, it might take me <clears throat> 80 minutes to make five gallons, where it used to take like 55 minutes to make five gallons. I actually was making a little bit better than five gallons an hour when you think about it. But so there's an extra 20 minutes, like who cares? I don't care, I'm not doing, it's not like I'm at the river beating my clothes on a rock to get them clean. I turn on a valve and I just watch and see what happens. And I just need to wait a little bit longer. If you're using timers instead of a float valve, God, please use a float valve. But if you're just using timers, adjust your timer so you don't forget and listen to your timer when it goes off. Don't just turn it off and say, I'll do that in a minute because this is a really important part of the show or whatever it is you're doing. Walk your butt over and turn it off <laughs> before you flood your home. It's so important, it's so easy to forget this. God, like I said, I've done it so many times. And when my house was crooked, the waters went right out the tile under the wall and out the brick outside. It was so convenient. And now I've got the foundation worked and I one time was making, I was doing the TDS creep thing, forgot to set the timer. Or I set the timer, but I was on a phone call and the thing vibrated and I hit stop and I kept doing my phone call. And I think it was like 40 minutes later, I was like, oh God, oh my God. And I run over there, there's water all over the washer, water down the side, actually the dryer, uh, water down the sides, this huge lake, and it wasn't going under the wall like the good old days. It was going everywhere into the kitchen because the house is level. I was like, dang it. <laughs> so you uh, definitely want to use a float valve when you can. Uh, I've even thought about creating some, where's my vase? I thought about creating something out of acrylic that has um, 
a fitting on it. Where did I put everything? Boy, am I productive. Here we go. Think about making a container with an elbow on the side and then black tubing coming out of it. So when I put this in for TDS creep, if I do forget and the water gets up to the fitting, it will then go out the drain and never overflow the jar and get the top of my dryer soaking wet, which I've done so many times. And I just never get around to it. But I don't want to just like run the TDS creep line straight into the drain because I could literally open the line where it's going straight in the drain and not even go into this, right? And it could just go there and I might not remember for four days. I'm like, oh my God, that's been running for four days and I didn't get one drop of DI water. I just sent it down the waistline forever. So I really prefer to see what I'm doing and I like to use timers, but I do make some mistakes and I do forget. So I'm trying to tell you, it's not if you're gonna make a mess, it's when you make a mess. So I try to avoid things with using float valves and timers to keep on top of things. And I'm constantly setting the timer on my wristwatch all the time to avoid that. But I do think I'll make my little acrylic box with my drain on the side that goes there. So if for some reason I'm an idiot, at least everything stays dry. And I should have done this like seven years ago <laughs> or 15 years ago, I don't know. It's really annoying. There we go. Terry says, I'm a mechanic, so I take pictures of stuff all the time so I know how it goes back together. Uh, when I was having to work on my stove a couple of years ago, I lifted the thing up and there were wires everywhere. And I just took pictures and video and I kind of went over everything. And then when I went to the place to get the parts, the guy's like, well, do you have this or this? And I just showed him the video. And he's like, oh, this is really helpful. And there was another time I had to do something and I went to Home Depot for something. And the guy was like, well, um, do you know what that's called? I'm like, I have no idea, but I have a video. And I showed him the video and he goes, oh, this is great. And he's like, oh, I see where that's going. Okay, we'll take, and he took me to another aisle, got me the one thing I needed. I came home and solved the problem. So pictures, I mean, your phone is so useful. Don't not use it, keep it handy. And and like I said, you can always put little notes. You can take a piece of tape, like I was describing, and you know you could stick it on there, and you could write on there whatever you want. Or you could put your piece of tape, if you don't want to put it on the housing, and you could wrap it around here, and you could write yourself a little note on the little flag so you know what it is. Or you can just put one, two, three, and then one, two, three, and that way when you're putting it all together, you just line everything up with the numbers or the ABCs or whatever. So, yep, very important. Kevin says, if my 60 gallon a day, no, I'm sorry, if my 60 gallon evaporates drastic amounts before I get, get a chance to top it off, besides salinity change, will it cause a drop in alkalinity? I've seen quite uh, a lot of alkalinity drops lately. No, I don't think that would affect your alkalinity at all. Salinity is changing, but I don't believe, I mean, unless it's a, mo I mean, when you say dr dramatically, are we talking about losing three inches of water out of your tank? Probably not. But if you're going down to half an inch or an inch for some reason, maybe you've got the air conditioner vent blowing on the tank or you've got fans blowing on the tank and it's really increasing the evaporation rate, my recommendation would get an auto top off installed on there and get a container under there. And if you need a container, I mean, you can buy anything. You can buy these jugs at, at Target or Walmart that are just the ideal size, made of, you know, they cost nothing, 10 bucks, and run a small pump into it and run the tubing up to the tank and top off based on the water level in the tank. But um, if you want something a little more fancy, I do make acrylic top-off containers that could be exactly the size you want, that hold the exact amount of gallons you need so it can last for several days. Also, one of the things that I do with some of my customers when I make them top-off reservoirs is I use the, I, I sell these float valves, by the way. Um, these are adjustable float valves and you saw how you could adjust it to like raise and lower this part. But what you didn't know is you can install it this way too. So it can be installed in the lid of your top-off container and adjust the float to whatever height you need. And then it does its job to um, not overflow the container. And when I make top off containers with these installed, you just put your RO tubing into here. And then your top off container has the pump in it. It has the power cord, obviously, and it has the tubing coming off. You know, that usually it's a, a soft tubing that goes up to the tank or over into the sump. And so that container, that reservoir is, the water level is dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and the float's just sitting there doing nothing because you have the cutoff valve on top. And then um, after whatever it is, three, four days, five days, something like that, you're like, okay, I wanna refill my reservoir. You would then burn off the TDS creep, 90 seconds, and then open the valve above it to now allow water to trickle into your container and take the next hour or two to fill it up again. 
and then the float rises and your thing makes shuddering noises and you go shut it off or close this valve that's all you gotta do is close the valve and stop the water from flowing and the RO system will turn off if it has the auto shut off valve included on your system some don't come with that thing but mine always have but I don't see how that could affect alkalinity The spiritual counselor says, over the past week, my RBTA started crawling around the rockwork, scaring the crap out of me. All of this just settled back into its spot. It's been in for over seven months. <laughs> I've seen that before, where they go everywhere in the tank and they go right back to where they came from. And, you know, because that was like the perfect spot, right? Sometimes they do that. They just do a wander and, yeah, they can sting some stuff. So, yep, sorry you got scared. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes they go to a tor terrible spot and you're moving all your corals away from it because you don't want to lose those corals to the stings of the anemone tentacles. Uh, Paul the Old Reefer says, have you noticed how you never need to descale a kettle if you only use RO water? I stopped uh, drinking tap water when I looked at my first used sediment filter. <laughs> yeah, oh, by the way, sediment filter, I want to talk about that. <clears throat> Let me unscrew this thing. sediment filter is dirt cheap uh, these are five bucks they're white when you put them in they should be eggshell when you take them out I have seen some and I posted a picture on Instagram about two months ago mine was the rustiest brown I'd ever seen in my life and I've lived in this house for 20 years I was shocked at how hideous it was and I was like this happened like in days it like super rapidly something from the city happened and it all got on here and I just took it out and replaced it and my new one that I put in like after a week or so was already getting a little discolored. But the sediment filter, because it's so inexpensive, you can swap it out more frequently. If you need, if where you live, you need to change it every single month, just do it. Because it is the first thing that stops all the big stuff from getting into the rest of the system. And if this is really clogged up, just think of what it's like to breathe when your nose is all stopped up and you can't breathe. And you're just like <sighs> breathing through your mouth because your nose is closed. So you want to make sure that this lets water go through it so your system isn't being starved of water because it doesn't help if you have a booster pump and you've got great PSI coming out of the pipes if this thing's clogged up. So stay on top of the sediment filter for sure. And then while we're talking about filters and I've got all these pieces around my feet here in my way, one of the things that I like to do is smell the carbon when I take it out. <laughs> I'm a weirdo. The, uh, the carbon is designed to remove chlorine from the water. And when you smell this, usually it will smell like a swimming pool. And you're like, wow, it really did pull some out. That chlorine would have eaten the membrane and destroyed it. So the carbons are very important too. Now, one thing I didn't talk about was chloramine on today's topic because it's like a whole other conversation. But basically chloramine is ammonia and chlorine locked together to form a bond. And it's really, really hard for an RODI system to break it down. So normally what happens is the RODI system filtered out everything except for the chloramines. The chloramines just went through every single stage including the DI and is still in your water inside your reservoir or your big barrel. So what you have to do is you have to do a couple of things. You have to slow the water going through the RO system to where it's passing through 20 inches of carbon for 20 minutes. Well, mathematically, that equates to using a 75 gallon a day membrane instead of a 100 gallon a day membrane because that's three gallons an hour, which is one gallon every 20 minutes. And when you have a system that has two carbons on it, that's your 20 inches of carbon. So 20 inches of carbon, 20 minutes of contact time will break down and separate the chlorine from the ammonia to their separated pieces and now they can be extracted by the system and you don't send chloramine into your tank. There are some brands, BRS sells them, SpectraPure sells them. They have these chloramine buster filters and I've never taken one apart to see what's in it. I haven't even ordered one. Um, but I believe you've got your sediment, you've got your chloramine buster, which is probably granulated activated carbon. And then you've got your carbon block because the granulated activated carbon will release dust and it'll go through and you want you don't want the dust to get into the membrane so you want it to, the dust to be stopped on this one so you've got sediment break down chloramine but that's only a 10 10 uh, inch filter not 20 inches but that is 10 inches and it is breaking it down and then you got 10 more inches of carbon here so that gets you there 20 
But if your RODI system is moving 150 gallons a day, 200 gallons a day, 300 gallons a day, it really doesn't have the 20 minute contact time that's demanded when it comes to uh, eliminated chloramine. But uh, that's how you would have set it up. Sediment, chloramine buster, carbon block, membrane, DI. All right. And uh, another thing Paul mentioned, you know, the kettle. If you're using an iron to iron your clothes, they always recommend distilled water. You can use RO water. I mean, that RO water might be a TDS of two or four or five. That's low enough, you won't get any weird uh, scaling on the bottom of the iron. Uh, Marcus, you must have asked me something in a separate question, but since I'm filtering it, I can't see it, so do it again. Insane Reefer says, I was at the local fish store buying a cleanup crew for my 180 gallon to replenish, and I was watching the stream on my way home. Well, thank you for watching television while driving. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> my, really, no comment. No comment at all. Uh, Dave says, what is your opinion on the 200 gallon a day water saver add-on? Do you use it to make more water and waste less water? Um, there are things called water savers. There's different things you can do. I mean, there's a lot of things. I got to move this thing. I'm stepping all over it. I don't like these under my toes. Okay. All right. I feel a little bit better. What a mess I have here. All right. <laughs> um... Let's say you have an RO system that uses two membranes. I really can't show you both. But um, you have one membrane hooked up that's doing the job, and then the water, the waste coming out of the membrane goes into the second membrane, and then you've got waste coming out of that that goes down the drain, and you've got good water coming out. So you've got good water coming out of this membrane, you've got good water coming out of the bottom membrane, and you're making more water, you're wasting less. Yes, that is true. You would waste less water because you're using some of the wastewater to make more RO water. So that is of a benefit. And uh, the other choice would be setting it up in series, which would, no, setting a parallel to where the water goes into both membranes and comes out of both membranes, that's actually not effective at all. That, if anything, it's making it harder because your PSI might not be able to support running the double membranes, you know, pushing water into two. Uh, and in a situation where you're running double membranes, you definitely want a booster pump because you want to have plenty of PSI. 75 and up would be ideal. But is it worth it? Is Yes. And then there's some people that will put in, um, they'll use... a different flow restrictor than what's recommended to have less wastewater come out of the drain line because they're so worried about wastewater. And because of it, it destroys the membrane faster. So basically they have to replace membranes more frequently instead of wasting water down the drain. Um, the thing about water, it's never truly wasted. The water that comes out of the pipes into our homes ends up going back out the pipes, back to the ocean, <laughs> back to the clouds, back to the lakes, back to the springs, back to the city, back to our homes again. Uh, water does not just go away. If it did, our planet would become like uh, the opposite, uh, you know, like uh, Mad Max movies where there's just dirt and people are fighting for drops of water. Um, but it's, it's not waste water like destroyed water. But it's also not good water to use for anything except for maybe watering plants or water in the foundation of your property, or washing your car, doing laundry. Um, it's not a huge expense, too. That's what everyone freaks out about. They see all that water, and like, oh my god, that's so much water. It's not. When you're making water, if you were to collect the wastewater at the same time in something logical, like your bathtub, you could then see how much water you collected. And you might say, Psh, I barely filled the tub a quarter of the way. Okay, no big deal. Because I guarantee you, we waste way more water leaving the water running while we brush our teeth, while we're washing our hands, uh, taking super long showers, uh, throwing the garden hose on the ground while you're doing something in the garden or while you're washing your vehicle and the water's just running down the driveway. That's where water's shooting out full tilt. This is a piece of the water. Some of the water's going to collect in our barrels and some of it's going down the drain, but it goes back to the city and it gets reused and it gets recleaned. So it's not being wasted. And 
mathematically, I did all this stuff a long, long time ago. I said, how much does it cost to make RODI water based on my water bill? And I did, I did everything. I crunched all the numbers. I said, let's say I just bought an RO system for the first time in my life. And that first year, I have to waste the first five gallons. I'm going to make this many gallons per month because I need top off and I need um, water change water. And I crunched it all. And I got to replace filters at six months. I got to replace the resin at once a year. So all those expenses. And I think it came out to seven cents per gallon, including the waste that went down the drain. And then I said, well, what about the second year? Now my RO system's been paid off in full. Now how much does it take for me? How much does it cost for me to make water? And I crunched all the numbers again, because in the second year, all I'm replacing is filters and the DI resin. And it was three cents per gallon, including the wastewater going down the drain. So in real terms of real numbers, it's dirt cheap to make your own water at home. It's way more convenient. And you can do it in the middle of the night in your underwear. <laughs> or um, you, know, you can do it during the storm. You can do it. Um, you know, while company's over, there's just it's just it's wonderful rather than hauling jugs in and out of your house. If uh, you're wanting to know, well, what does it cost my water bill to run an RO system? The only thing I can tell you to do is be aware of your water bill now. A normal month, not a month where you ran the sprinklers nonstop because it's a thousand degrees outside. Okay, uh, maybe it'd be better to measure this during the winter. But if you were to just use your water like you normally do in the house during the winter and then you suddenly turn on our system and use it for a month and see what your water bill is odds are your water bill is going to go up like maybe five dollars a month so that's nothing and that's literally what mine was mine went up five and i was running two aquariums at the time and i had a hundred gallon a day system that i only had to use once a week and uh yeah it didn't cost anything so i highly recommend it and i just happened to talk about david brooks question about chloramines so carbon block is not going to do it, but carbon, uh, the loose carbon, the GAC that's packed in the cartridge, that is the one that breaks down chloramines. Uh, Insane Reefer says he's watching the diaries each morning and he's driving to work. Some people said they're watching the diaries before they go to sleep. So apparently it works any time of day. <laughs> and thank you for watching. Luca says, what do you plan to add next when it comes to fish? I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Uh, the spiritual counselor says, I was laughing when you said, twist the broken valve out of the membrane gently but forcefully. You know, it's so true, though. <laughs> you want to do it a very specific way. And there's another one. Um, I need a T-fitting. Actually, it's not this T-fitting. It's a different one. It's one that has threads on it. And it's on the side of my DI stage. And when you have to install the... How do I keep losing stuff? Because the base is in the way. When you're trying to install these probes from the dual TDS meter into these fittings, it is really hard. And I tell people when you're trying to do this, let me loosen the twist tie. So you're trying to put this probe into your T and you, you push it in a little bit and then you turn it on and pfft, water goes everywhere because it's not in far enough. I tell people to put your thumb on the top and put your finger underneath where the tubing was, take the tubing out, and you are going to push this thing in forcefully. And it's in. And you can even you know tug it apart just enough to get that blue clip on there. And fortunately, you only have to install it one time and you never have to do it again. Um, really hard to install that. And I tell people, you need to push on it so hard you think you're going to break it, but don't break it. And so, it, again, it's kind of gently, forcefully make it happen. Use your willpower, but you're going to be like, holy crap, this is difficult. And then once it's installed, like I said, it's done. And the one reason I really, the thing I really like about this meter is it has a bracket that glues to the back of your, or glues to the metal part of your RO system. So you can have this loose to open up the back, take out the screws. It uses a double A battery you can swap out. It's not some special little tiny hearing aid batteries. You got to find the right one or that stupid circle disc thing that looks like a quarter that only works in a scale. It's a real battery like we all have. And that is how I install those probes. And they're not, and it's not easy to install. It's hard. So there are certain things we have to do 
that actually take quite a bit of force, but we don't want to be a gorilla and destroy it. So yeah, I might use an oxymoron phrase, but I think you get what I'm saying. <laughs> it may sound weird, but you're like, he's right. I'm usually right, aren't I? Almost always. Almost always. Um, Lee says, pressure gauge, air or glycerin based? The pressure gauge that I was showing you guys actually has oil in it. And the thing is, I don't get a guarantee of what I receive. When I place my order and I get my pallet of stuff, sometimes they have oil in them and sometimes they don't. They do have this rubber plug on the top, so you actually could open it up and you could pour in your own glycerin in here. Um, I, My brain might be wrong here because I'm tired. But uh, I believe glycerin is mineral oil. So you probably could use mineral oil in here too. And it's just for the needle. And I think the reason that the oil is in there is so that the needle, if it's getting this weird pressure fluctuation, it doesn't rattle. It just kind of keeps it quieter. I, I like the look. I think it looks better with the oil inside there. I remember when I got some and then they sent me the kind without. I was like, hey, mine don't have oil in them. What's the deal? You're ripping me off. <laughs> and they said, they don't always come that way. But they said, but if you want, you can open them up and fill it yourself. And I was like, oh, forget it. But I've been getting them with oil filled for a long time. Annie's Reef says, what is the best way to avoid a siphon on the ATO reservoir, the auto top off reservoir? I'm planning a bigger container that's high, got a higher water level than the sump. Thank you for asking that question. That's a great question. So, um, just gonna have to do the mental game for this one. I don't have any props I can work with. Your reservoir is full to here. Your sump is down here. You've got a pump in here that pushes water over into here. There's a couple things you can do. And there's a couple things I've done in the past. Uh, currently with my system, I use the ATK from uh, Neptune Systems that works with the Apex ecosystem. And the way it works, they have a pump and they use orange RO tubing. And they have a valve in there that looks like my check valve I showed you guys. You know, one of these things with a tiny hole drilled in the side. And when the pump turns on, water squirts out and it squirts down. If you install it upside down, it would, no, there's no, it's just a, a straight fitting. It's not a check valve. It's just a connector, okay? Um, if you put it upside down, it shoots water straight up. So I made a point to make sure it was pointed where the water would shoot down and toward the back. So when my pump turns on, I can see water squirting out the back and going down the back of my reservoir. And then, of course, the bulk of the water goes into the sump. And then when the power turns off on the pump, this sucks in air. And uh, the last of the water in the tubing goes this way. And the majority of it goes straight back into the reservoir. And there is no back siphon. Um, another thing I've done in the past, that's why I was looking for a piece of tubing I could use. Um, let's pretend this valve is your pump. And here's your reservoir. And you've got water that's going up and out and over and down into the sump. I would keep this end up high. And then you could put underneath it like a PVC pipe that's on a... A, some kind of a holder or I actually use a clear pipe like they use for a standpipe in an aquarium for the under gravel filters you can get those at Petco or PetSmart and I stood that up very high and whenever my top off turned on I could see the water running down that pipe and refilling the sump and then when the power shut off to the pump to stop adding water this would stop it would dribble a little bit and then the rest of the water just sucked back into the container where it belonged because it back siphoned but it wouldn't because I had this so high up it couldn't siphon water or do anything weird equalizing. If you were to have this pump in the reservoir, this tube is not gonna cooperate, and you had the other end in the sump, it will literally make the two match <laughs> like they do. So you wanna have this up high and go into something. So a big tall piece of PVC pipe is a great way to do it and just secure the pipe in place with zip ties. What I did, I made my stuff out of the clear pipe like I described and I made this fancy acrylic base that had a post on it and I set the base on my sump the post sticking up like a thumb. I put my clear pipe on top. I put my tubing in the top. I put a little zip tie to hold the tubing in the pipe and it just turned on and off for years that way. And anytime it was topping off, I could see the water run down the pipe and then when it turned off, it would immediately break it. And it worked perfectly. Another trick you could use if you don't want to use a regular pump um, like the like a Ciche or a Eheim or a Pima or I mean, there's so many different pumps. 
you can use an aqua lifter. The aqua lifter is this little pump that uses three watts of power, costs like 11 bucks, I think, online, and it will suck water up, go through, and then come out. And it's sitting on top of your reservoir, so it's way up high. And as it sucks up water upward and then goes out and then trickles down into your sump, the you shouldn't get the siphoning effect because of the way that thing is operated. It's sort of like a peristaltic pump inside it. And so it should, I mean, I used one forever like that. But again, I use the riser pipe. I like that method because it doesn't let it spatter or spill anywhere except where I want it to go. But you definitely have to have something at the apex point to break the siphon so that it sucks in air. <clears throat> Uh, Reef Dude says, what's the thinnest possible top-off container you could float a valve in? Oh, I'd say about three inches across inside, internally, um, because the valve itself is like an inch and three quarters, but it's gonna be really hard to install the first time. You're gonna have to like feed it in through a hole and kind of get that part in and then tighten your nut down. Fortunately, once it's done, it's done, and it could be there forever, but that'd be really narrow. And then, of course, um, you have to find what pump you're going to put in there too it has to fit that diameter and some pumps might be larger than the float valve they might be two and a quarter or three inches three and a quarter inches wide but there's so many different ones on the market and even auto aqua has all these tiny things too so you may find it you know something very narrow could work the biggest thing for me is i like to have a container that fits the space and has enough room to um install all the gear and it's still cleanable <laughs> If you can't get your hand in there to clean it, that's always a frustrating thing for me. Linda's Reef says, if carbon only lasts a few days in tanks, how come the carbon filters in the RO system can last for months? That's a great question. Um, I would think, I don't know. I, I don't know the physical answer to that. I think we're talking about pure water, or we're talking about tap water versus, which has got chlorine in it, versus a reef tank full of bacteria. Um, I don't know. I've never had anyone ask me that before, and I've never thought of it myself. But it's um, it's proven. <laughs> Water filtration has been the same for a long time. But when it comes to reef tanks, putting the carbon in your tank, uh, yeah, in your tank itself, it just doesn't last as long as people hope. A lot of people put carbon in, say I change it once a month, but you can see the effects for about three days, and after that, you can see it's already losing its effect, uh, eff efficacy. And all of a sudden you're looking at the tank and it doesn't have that nice clean water. It looks more yellow because it's already worn out. Hey, tech HR, I don't think I'm sharing too much. I think many of us wear underwear. <laughs> all right, so that was all the questions that uh, someone had posted to me today. I obviously missed a ton of your comments because I filtered it down to just the questions. But I hope you enjoyed today's live stream. I still have to do some work on the reef tank today for today's diary. That will be diary number 31. Um, if you have not even tried to look at the reef diaries yet, if you're one of those people, just know that they tend to be about four inches on, <laughs> four inches, four minutes on average. And uh, I just talk about what I worked on the tank that day. And I think a lot of people are looking at those timestamps thinking, oh, Mark's doing more of these two hour videos. <laughs> and I'm not. It might be two minutes, it might be four minutes, it might be eight. Yesterday's was ten and a half minutes because we kind of did sort of a in real time scenario. But uh, I like to keep them brief and just tell you what I actually did that day to kind of give you an eyeball view of what it's like to run a reef tank and maybe run a reef tank my size. And I just feel like that way you kind of get to see the reality of what it's like to reef keep versus um, when you get the sporadic updates, you kind of really don't know all the things that went wrong or all the things that were tweaked or even the tiny minor adjustments we do on a daily basis. And I'm trying to remember to include each of those things. And there's still days where I do some little minor thing that I might even forget to put in the diary, but uh, I'm trying to be good about it. So I, um, I do encourage you to watch it. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I think today I will do the stats and see how we did for the first 30 days, how many people viewed it and, you know, what channel where they watched it from kind of you know put some statistics together just for fun i also want to remind you today's water test saturday you are supposed to test all your water in your tank today because water tests save lives and we want to make sure that we are staying on top of it before your tank starts deteriorating now i know it sounds really ironic coming from me who's dealing with a tank that's deteriorating but i've kind of stopped the bleed there's um it seems to be holding We'll see how things go. But uh, for now, it seems to be all right. I think we're at the point now where 
it has stabilized and in a few weeks I'll be planting new stuff in there which will be a fun thing to share it'll be a nice diary as we plant new corals or shop for new corals those will be nice entries they'll be a lot more fun than oh look today more stuff died that was really depressing but um, you definitely want to test your water so I want you to check everything and so while we're testing things check your RODI system out test your TDS see what the tap water is today just find out what it is maybe put it in your logs so you can measure again in six months and what is your tap water like in the spring versus in the summer um, we want to make sure that our membranes and filters are all and uh, de di resin is all current and clean if you don't remember when you changed them last get in the habit of putting dates on things so that way you can look at it and say oh it's been six months it's time or oh i just did that two months ago i can wait a while i mean it's just nice to know and a lot of times we forget about things like that we don't necessarily um document when we installed a light bulb or when we uh, installed carbon or the, whatever i mean it, these are things that we do and then we can't remember when we did them last so if you are really wanting to you know journal all your stuff you can journal how often you put in carbon when you dose for dibio when you use microbacter 7 um, when you cleaned out your algae turf scrubber when you siphoned your sand bed <laughs> there's a lot of things we do and you could actually kind of see over time you do these every month or you do these every six months or you haven't done this in forever and you need to we also want to double check all your dosing containers make sure they're filled that they're not too low or about to run out and you want to make sure that your dosing pumps you hit the test button on them that liquids coming out of all the tubes and none are obstructed if they are one of the things you can do is hold the t you know your fingertip on the bottom of the tube and just roll your fingers back and forth and break up the crusties so liquid can flow out of it again so you don't suddenly have an alkalinity deficiency in your tank because the pump came on but it couldn't get out the tube the whole time and your reef didn't get what it needed that day or those days so water testing lets you know these things and if you just look at the reef and say everything's fine then typically something won't be fine and you'll be playing this catch-up game trying to fix things which invariably costs more money than if you just took care of it in the first took in care of it in the first place <laughs> so stay on top of your reef make sure everything's nice and clean test your water check your results post your results and call me club milos reef so we can see it and uh, i'll see you guys again next week on another live stream bye